This episode of the Scene and the Unseen is brought to you by Intel. In 1890, Lucy Jervis, the wife of Lord Harris, the governor of Bombay, challenged her husband to a game of cricket. It took place in the hill resort of Mahabaleshwar. Jervis or Lady Harris led a team of 13 women, while her husband's team had the usual 11 men. A magazine called Cricket carried this account from a correspondent. "Quote: We are all feeling quite exhausted with laughing. The ladies were most dreadfully in earnest, but so nervous. Every run, every ball led to a comical situation. Their nervousness at running, the way they met in the middle." of each wicket and consulted as to whether it was safe to go on and finally each would run back to her own wicket the way they threw themselves on the ball in fielding and had to make a search in their petticoats for it stop quote even at this distance the condescension the patronizing tone makes me so mad and that's not just a 19th century tone you hear it around you today in private drawing rooms and public social media where women's cricket is looked upon as a curiosity In recent times so there have been stirrings of change the excerpt i read out is from a superb book called the fire burns blue a history of women's cricket in india by karunya keshav and the late siddhant patnayak and my guest today is someone who's been part of this journey of women's cricket both as someone who played for india and as someone who has written with great insight and eloquence about the game and she's thrown herself headlong into another movement that i care a lot about the one that's happening in the creator economy Can someone really be part of two revolutions in one lifetime? Welcome to the Seen and the Unseen, our weekly podcast on economics, politics, and behavioral science. Please welcome your host, Amit Varma. Welcome to the Seen and the Unseen. My guest today is Snehal Pradhan, who has been a fast bowler for the Indian team, a cricket journalist, a TV commentator, a radio commentator in multiple languages, a YouTuber, and someone who teaches both how to play cricket and how to do multimedia sports journalism. She may do many things, but she is not a dabbler. She is one of the best cricket writers in the game today, and in fact, a true all-rounder. Her reportage can be vivid and evocative. Her opinion pieces are always clear and incisive. Very few people can do both so well. Her understanding of cricket, her mastery of the craft of writing, and most of all, her work ethic and willingness to learn new forms like YouTubing is crazy. I'm a Snehal Pradhan fanboy and was delighted when she agreed to come on this show. Before we begin this conversation though, let's take a quick commercial break. Artificial intelligence seems like such a scary term. When we look into the future, AI can seem both magical and dystopian. But it seems that way only till it actually exists. Everything around us right now, all of the internet and so much outside it runs on AI. From maps to social media to the content we consume to the cabs we take to the water we drink. One of the unseen forces behind this everyday magic is a sponsor of this episode Intel. For anyone who wants to harness the power of AI without reinventing the wheel, Intel has a range of products and solutions. The third gen Intel Xeon scalable processors pack in more power than any other solution and are insane bang for the buck. Intel works with various partners to offer AI based solutions and Intel's AI even helped improve Washington DC's water distribution. You may not realize it, but AI is everywhere, and where there's AI, there's Intel. Snehal, welcome to the Seen and the Unseen. Thank you for having me, Amit. While going through the videos on your excellent cricket coaching channel on YouTube, I came across one that intimidated me a hell of a lot, which was what you know, a day in your life uh, doing commentary in the IPL, <laughs> and in that you were. doing two commentary stints in a day one in english for a test match and one in marathi for the ipl and then i you know went through your newsletter posts and your very first newsletter post said that i am writing this on a day i am doing two commentary stints and i was like <laughs> my god what's what's kind of happening here and you you've really in a sense that's almost a mirror of your life because it it feels so rich to me at you know just kind of reading about you and looking at all the work that you've uh, done in all these different fields but uh, i i want to kind of start before any of that kicks in take me back to your childhood growing up where did you grow up how did you get drawn to sports so firstly very kind of you to say that nice to hear you know what what the life looks like from the outside in growing up born and brought up in pune we used to live in a joint family where uh, i was born and uh, spent the first 8 years of my life so very lucky to have uh, the kind of upbringing that allowed us both space in terms of uh, physical space we had a our family had a bungalow where it was my grandparents paternal grandparents uh, my grandfather's mother 
and my family as in dad mom my brother and myself my uncle's family and all of us kind of living in the same joint family setup we had a bungalow with a little bit of a garden at the back there was a small outhouse which was converted into an office for my grandparents and my dad's work and there was this this lovely society it was a bungalow society which was originally constructed for refugees who came over from pakistan sindhi refugees so it had this beautiful garden called an oval garden it was an oval garden where we used to have a lot of space to cycle like that's where i learned to cycle that's where i played cricket found some empty space found a few boys playing and i joined in uh, used to pop over to my neighbor's uh, place and she had a bunch of older cousins again joined family and she was the only girl yeah yeah the only girl and then all the older cousins and they were always playing cricket and so she and i would uh, join in um that's kind of been a theme whenever there's been a cricket match happening usually almost not usually almost always boys and i would just join in as the only girl um i remember you know not not being um stopped by who was playing in terms of whether it was a boys so with not being stopped by gender or not being stopped by class i mean as a small kid i had no perception of that i suppose the servants kids were playing i was playing with them and then afterwards i i would you know bring them all to bring them all home and they would sit and they would watch cable tv along with us although they used to always sit a little off to the side like in the veranda but that's that's a memory that i have and i i played all sports as a kid soon when i was like 8 years old in 2 3rd standard i shifted schools there was one school where i was not so happy um, we also moved out and started to live separately my dad mom and family so therefore we moved to another place another home i shifted schools there also pretty much every sport i used to play table tennis badminton mm, we didn't have much else but there was always cricket happening on a saturday morning on the field on the uh, the school field it was all the school boys who would kind of just come over and play and i would i would just join those games i would go there be the only girl in those games that was like completely normal for me so it was in that sense until that point at least very as a sheltered normal kind of a bringing exposure to sports was incidental but my affinity to sports was probably something that was always there my parents tell stories about you know since uh, being able to walk and run picking up something and swinging it around probably influenced by uh, what i was seeing on tv because uh, someone born in the late 80s growing up to cable television sachin tendulkar desert storm all that so you know you've described in another interview how your grandmother was both an msc and someone who was into sports and all of that and i guess being from pune again uh, like i spent many years in pune uh, you know through college and all of that uh, my wife is from there so i i kind of have a sense of that culture where you know uh, learning is venerated and one learning is venerated and and two another interesting thing about pune you know in contrast to uh, where i was born in the north is that women are expected it's it's completely normal to go around and do things to work for a living Mm. and you will kind of see them uh, everywhere which is not uh, as much the case in many other parts of the country but given sort of this um, uh, the, these common uh, factors of both you know uh, the, that respect for education running in your family because you mentioned when your grandmother got her msc in the 50s it was like pretty rare and at the same time the fact that uh, you know sports was considered completely normal what were your early aspirations like like as a kid growing up what did you think you want to be if you thought of that at all i mean i, I don't think it should think too much of these things just go through life and enjoy but uh, and at uh, around what point did it become apparent to you that hey i am good at this cricket thing that i can do this seriously um so to give you a little bit of the family background from the education point of view or you know just in general what the uh, situation was like my uh, grandparents paternal grandparents in the 1950s yeah 50s had an intercaste love marriage my grandfather got a phd in marine biology and my grandmother got an msc in marine biology both of them met when they were researchers at the tarapur wala uh, aquarium they were both uh, from mumbai and on my mother's side my maternal grandmother uh, actually both my maternal grandparents were uh, teachers i never knew my but uh, my maternal grandfather he passed away when my mother was very young but even his father i believe if i'm getting this right was like a pali scholar and had some connection to harvard i think he 
gone there taught there something like that is that that is in the family history which i keep hearing about uh, father's an engineer so yes both my brothers are engineers both my brothers are educated in terms of you know one is an mba one is an msc uh, msc or ms ms and that's the culture so i'm the odd one out i'm the sports person in the family but very much the emphasis was on you know play as much as you want sure but you can do both and you should do both and that was ingrained in me from a young age so i scored very well in my 10th and 12th um my grandfather had this deep desire and still yesterday we were chatting at night and he's like azu nahi tu engineering kela paiche <laughs> still you should go and do engineering um but at the time um i chose not to do engineering because just out of 12th and i had been playing cricket for a while and i'll come back to that but um, i didn't even give the um, the cet that i think my batch was the first batch where they had that cet and I, i i was so sure that i'm not going to do engineering i didn't even give it um because i knew that i wanted to study something which would allow me to pursue cricket because by that time i knew that i wanted to pursue cricket who knows what it would lead to uh, in fact i was just last week having a dinner with one of my mentors and she was recalling this incident where my grandmother uh, and this is probably a good time to tell that story how i fell into cricket is that you know after having played in these very informal setups being the only girl etc there was one time where i went to a cricket ground and the coach over there told me okay tie your hair inside your hat i don't want people outside seeing that there is a girl here um and having done a little bit of that so my grandmother luckily knew that women's cricket existed because in the same society that i had described before where we used to live together a former india captain used to live and she knew of them because of having lived in the same society and uh, so this former india captain shubhangi kulkarni who's uh, a veteran of you know not just in the cricket but also in the administrative sense my grandmother tracked her down <laughs> asked her you know okay where can uh, she practice she i think he went and met her then sent me to meet her and then i got the guidance as to this is where the maharashtra team practices in pune so i started going to nehru stadium which is about 5 6 kilometers from where i was staying so every morning my dad would get up and drive me there and i would take a rickshaw back or something like that later on i started cycling that distance to and fro sometimes twice a day but one of the one of the important points here is that it's so random that i discovered that women's cricket exists and there might be so many more talents who didn't get that opportunity at the right time i was probably in 9th standard 8th or 9th standard having you know doubled in all sports when i discovered this organized women's cricket and i'm physically gifted uh, from the athletic point of view you could say um, i'm 6 feet tall almost um, had the frame of an athlete kind of uh, so immediately despite wanting to my aspirations despite wanting to be a wicket keeper god alone knows why i was told okay you're nice and tall take 20 steps and bowl and that's how i kind of became a fast bowler uh, even even just thinking going back to that uh, going even further back in time i remember as a kid wanting to be an air force pilot thinking wow that's so cool you know fighter planes and all that all those cartoons we were watching probably is the reason you know those swat cats and stuff that had uh, really cool missiles and what not probably influence uh, more than anything else then went through a non violent phase and said no no i don't want to join the air force because it involves killing people and what not god alone knows what i was watching and what influenced me for that but cricket was kind of a constant around the 9th standard i started regularly playing for maharashtra pretty much graduated from playing zero organized cricket to maharashtra under 16s and maharashtra senior and maharashtra um, under 19s is that a helicopter yeah i think there's a <laughs> helicopter somewhere <laughs> above me but yeah uh, but it won't show up on your tracks so <laughs> yeah. just so random in mumbai a helicopter <laughs> why, um, why can't so we have helicopters <laughs> <laughs> carry on <laughs> I, i would very i would not be surprised to hear trains but helicopters <laughs> okay anyways so that's how i kind of fell into organized cricket um and i discovered that yes this is something that um is i'm good enough at that i can play at the state level straight away i mean to be fair the competition was very thin the number of girls playing cricket like we just pointed out is accidental how girls find cricket is accidental so the number of girls actually playing cricket is really small so most new kids on the block who came in would uh, if they were any good would walk straight into a state team but we had some really good seniors and uh, they helped set up the journey of course no coach we're just talking about an era where we did everything ourselves and we just learned from our seniors 
including you know uh, rolling the pitch in the morning staking out the nets setting up the entire nets paying the groundsman a little bit to uh, help us here and there that was all done by us and that was how the state team practiced in those days you know, this is early 2000s it's which is just kind of mind boggling to think back on now I just finished reading uh, the Fire Burns Blue, the excellent book by uh, Karunya Keshav and Siddhant Patnaik on women's cricket, and there was this almost uh, hard to believe kind of description of how in 1997, when the Women's World Cup happened in India, they actually had to shift the date of the final because there was a men's India versus New Zealand match on the same day, and therefore Doordarshan wouldn't have telecast it. Obviously, they would have telecast the men's match, and uh, so the date for the final had to be shifted. So I'm I'm just curious because in those years, I don't remember getting to see any women's cricket on TV. It simply wasn't uh, there in my consciousness at all. So all these years, when as a kid you are learning to play, and uh, you know you're playing with the boys out there and all of that, and you're thinking of a life in cricket, perhaps what are you actually you know looking ahead to? Because a male cricketer, you know, he's surrounded by cricket; it's all there. What are you actually looking at? Is it initially just a thing of oh, I love the sport, I want to do this, and that's the only thing that drives you? Or then do you start thinking seriously about what is the route? What are my chances of making it? When I get there, what happens? Do you think about that stuff at all, or uh, how did that play out? So, in terms of what are we kind of building up to, there was nothing uh, concrete. We knew that an Indian team existed. We knew that you know, okay, you might get to play for India someday, and that was a dream. That was a definite. That was a definite dream, um, a, a vague dream because we didn't really know how to play for India. Uh, besides, you know, doing well at the tournaments and whatnot, there was no plan. We had a few seniors around to kind of guide us, and luckily, we had a few seniors who were playing in the Indian team at that time. So they were kind of examples who we could look up to. Otherwise, the influence of men's cricket was always there when you know we're turning on any kind of media men's cricket is around there was women's cricket in bits and pieces on tv i remember very vividly that 2002 series where julan goswami made her debut that one was on tv and seeing her watching her bowl for the first time on tv really crystallized that dream okay yeah, you thinking you know i want to play for india what does that look like i want to open the bowling with julan goswami that was how the dream was crystallized in my mind what is that going to give me in terms of you know a career a profession anything like that absolutely no idea absolutely no idea how to even ask that question i'm not even sure whether that question could articulate itself in my mind at the time because still in my student years so probably far away from kind of taking a decision uh, on that front the emphasis on kind of building education side by side was always there because there was this understanding that women's cricket does not pay you of course at the state level we were earning zero um at the india level players who played for india were earning a little bit of money this is of course pre bcci days so women's cricket was administered by the women's cricket association of india and i'm sure you've read lots of stories in that book of how things used to be but honestly only people within the women's cricket circuit could see that okay this is the indian team and have a vague idea okay if you want to get there you have to go through these tournaments etc and some of us were lucky enough to have uh, seniors who were actually in the indian team or role models like uh, juludi who you know i want to be like this but like you said in the public consciousness the indian women's team hardly existed which is i mean a very different scenario from the 1970s and early 80s when the women's team was you know uh, a well, much larger i won't say a big but a large, much larger part of the public consciousness and the public conversation so it was kind of up to us to make our own road we saw a vague destination and uh, then we were kind of figuring it out on the way just for my listeners the fire burns blue is an excellent book which uh, talks about the journey of women's cricket from the 70s onwards when it really started and what a lonely journey it was for so many people and, and and you know the the kind of struggles that people had to go through so worth reading and just for perspective like you said the bcci took over women's cricket in 2006 and things kind of changed after that which we'll discuss also the other thing that i'm curious about and i you know remember writing a piece long long ago about how 
commentary, uh, just television commentary, satellite television, changed the way a lot of young players understood the game and therefore grew because it was listening to commentary on uh, satellite television in the early 90s, listening to international commentators, especially that you got a sense, not just of nuances of strategy and tactics, but also the importance of fitness and the importance of different kinds of work ethic that kind of come into play, which would have at some level, you know, influenced a generation of uh, uh, players after that. And and obviously, there are many more reasons why people are so much fitter and so much more professional and all of that. But certainly the commentary helped. And in a sense, I see that turbocharged today, like in the kind of work that you do, I'm sure a lot of people learn uh, tons of stuff from your commentary and your YouTube videos, not just because you're explicitly coaching stuff, but just talking about the nuances of the game is an education It's in itself for someone who's listening. So, you know, you mentioned elsewhere that in those growing up years that listening to that TV commentary kind of made an impact to you. And you've also just said that you didn't have a coach when you kind of went early in. So what is that process of then learning to play the game like? Like at one level, of course, you learn by doing. You do something again and again and you kind of figure out what action works best for you and blah, blah, blah. But at another level, you have this realization from what you see of international cricket that there are methods and there is a way of thinking and all of that, but you don't actually have actual human guidance. So what was that process of learning about the game like for you? In one word, slow. Because, you know, as much as it's it's absolutely true that the more you do something, the better you get at it. The fact is that if you want to move through that learning process fast, having a guide, having someone to accelerate that process for you is absolutely essential. In our early years, it was literally our seniors who taught us, you know, the one, two, three, fours of batting and what to think, how to kind of ask questions, how to get to know our own action. Why is this ball going wide? Think about it yourself. So that was a slow process because obviously these are players who, you know, are currently in the Indian team or just uh, having been in the Indian team. They're focused on their own game and it's complete generosity of time, effort that they are also passing on that knowledge to the younger generation, which is something which is ingrained in our uh, culture, uh, especially the cricket culture, the women's cricket culture. But it's, you know, limited in terms of it's not their job to do it. It's a coach's job to do it. And we didn't really have that structured coaching. We could watch on TV. I remember um, having a conversation with Shubangi Gulkarni. I used to spend a lot of time sitting in the sunny sports shop. She runs a sports shop here in Pune, which is quite well known. And she's, it's, it's literally a cricketer's adda. There will at any point of day be some former cricketer, current cricketer, either shopping or sitting there and chatting and talking about stuff. So I picked up a lot from there, picked up a lot from her advice, which is just watch the game closely. Sometimes more than the actual commentary, I learned from the actions that are happening on the field because with commentary, you have to kind of be in the moment, immediately move from the previous ball to the next ball. Can't deep dive into what's happened, why it's happened, how you can make it happen for you. So it's more about just watching and trying to adapt that. I remember when we first um, got a sense of, you know, strong guidance in terms of uh, one of the seniors who played for our team, Amrita Shinde, who's been another mentor of mine. When she came into the team and she wasn't playing for Maharashtra, she was playing for Air India for a few years. But when the BCCI took over and when Air India team disbanded because they didn't find a place in the domestic tournament, which mirrored the men's tournament, she came back and a few other senior players who were playing for Air India came back. And she brought with her, I mean, she just took upon herself to pass on this knowledge to us again, while side by side trying to resurrect her international career. And we probably, you know, contributed a lot for that she was not able to focus on that. We were all uh, troublesome teenagers. But she brought a exposure to the international level, firstly. She already played international cricket. She had been in a professional environment. Air India is a team which employed women's cricketers on a yearly contract basis. So they were basically not doing anything else. They were not studying. They were not side by side working any other jobs. They were playing cricket all the time. They had coaches. They had interaction with not just coaches, but also the best of other international players because the Air India team at the time is Julan Goswami, Anjum Chopra, Anju Jain, Karuna Jain, Jaya Sharma. No, not Jaya Sharma. But, you know, all these kind of players. So that entire knowledge factory she brought back and revolutionized the kind of way we used to train, revolutionized the drills we used to do. 
just made us think in a very different way about how we should be approaching regular nets and it the 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 result on the performance was outstanding i mean in that first i think in the first 3 years after the bcci took over maharashtra reached three finals and yes i mean it was great that we had three really good players coming back from air india but it was the younger lot it was my generation and we were like literally 19 20 year olds who were pushing um, and helping uh, the state team perform because of this guidance that we were suddenly receiving so how much of a difference it can make you know you can watch as much as you want and absorb and try it out yourself but having someone being able to accelerate that process is just invaluable in cricket and which is why i mean coaching is something that i stress on a lot now in my current role but back then if you ask the moment when our cricket really transformed from you know kids who were just trying to figure it out to having someone who knew the ropes show us the ropes was it was it was a big moment yeah in fact you have a pretty moving video about how one of your regrets was that there were these 3 4 years where you know before uh, she shifted back to uh, playing for maharashtra from air india where you kept thinking should i approach her for tape should i take her help should i try to train with her and you were just hesitant and you didn't do it and later you regretted it because you thought my god if i'd learned all of this a little earlier can you give me some concrete examples of specific ways in which she uh, sort of helped your uh, your cricket both in terms of uh, you know the actual game itself and also the mindset which you mentioned yeah absolutely so firstly in terms of our preparation the just the physical preparation was what she emphasized on so much that we have to be at a level of fitness that allows us to perform otherwise you know the skill is just not going to come out so our net sessions were preceded by an hour of uh fielding and fitness drills and she would build fielding into our fitness drills uh something she's very well known for is uh, the ladder drill and uh, that kind of became what our team was known for you know the team that carries around the ladder and we were the only team that was doing it at the time and now you know it's just so common that it shows how ahead of her time she was just the extent to which she would push us in terms of our strength training of course no gym huh? we had absolutely zero gym access it was just basic push ups squats body weight training but the amount of repetitions that she made us do we had never imagined are baap re itne bhi ho sakte hai and i remember watching her herself i mean she is this well known on the uh, women's cricket circuit when she was playing as this incredibly fit cricketer her fielding is really well known her short catching in terms of uh, close in catching short leg silly point is a uh, really well known and she was the kind of player who you know back in 2005 6 as a w- woman cricketer was able to do those push up and clap you know the ones where you press down you push up you're in the air you clap and then you come back and uh, push down again she was able to do that and we were like oh my god how are you able to do that and then she was trying to pass on the processes of you know how much you have to start how many push ups you have to do and without actually telling us she was just building it into our warm ups i remember the first tournament we had when we went to uh, first tournament we had under the bcci or species when she had joined the team we were traveling to mumbai and uh, the tournament was in mumbai and during that bus journey everyone was sleeping listening to music chatting she was sitting at the back of the bus one by one calling each member of the team behind and telling them this is what your job is i remember having that conversation with her she's like no variations just bowl the ball in one place i was like okay and now it's so common this is called role clarity which you know every t20 team talks about 2006 we've never had this kind of role clarity before it's just a half an hour team meeting where ha ah, yes do your best and uh, bowl here bowl there what to do what not to do nothing like that so in terms of the mindset everyone was given a very clear specific uh, role as this is what the expectations are so that setting of expectations and then measuring against those expectations was fantastic she would constantly keep reminding me about you know how um, fearsome i could be as a bowler because like i said uh, very rare for women to be so tall and you know generate the kind of bounce that i did so she's like why are you bowling with the mid off you you don't need a mid off you just put a fielder there in front of the batter's face and you bowl that's the kind of and i was like how can i bowl without a mid off i mean 
in in my cricketing years i was even you know towards the uh, later half of my cricketing years i was this person with that hesitancy and that uh, uncertainty was a part of uh, my personality and she was constantly reinforcing that this is something that you can overcome and kind of think bigger about yourself um and this is the potential that you have and uh, we were slowly 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 growing into the possibility that okay she might be right that's kind of so mind blowing and sounds so ahead of a time but where did she get all this rope from because i'm assuming that one when she came into sort of playing for the state and all that there were still no coaches around obviously because this was before your time so is this stuff that she started picking up when she got to the national team or playing internationally or uh, is it just a remarkably sm- smart and enterprising person who you know figures it out from here and there how and she's going to hate me for uh, talking so much about her and you know even saying that you should have her on your podcast but uh, she's she's this very um, reserved person very private person and um, i actually don't even know whether i should be saying all this about her but she is someone who learned a lot from observing others uh, very quickly she was born in kolhapur moved to pune because she was a talented cricketer at a very young age um, and i remember her telling me that she spent there was a there was a camp at maybe pune club or some other ground in pune where frank tyson had come down and he was training i think some a bunch of boys and she joined in and you know aced the fitness tests was some sometimes even beating the boys so she was always kind of exposing herself to these kind of environments where she will be able to pick up so many things i remember her and our other senior cricketers like kalyani umrani they were regularly training with maharashtra ranji cricketers uh, the rishikesh kanetkars who are in base in pune and therefore picking up a lot of from them and which is something which doesn't really happen and didn't really happen to my generation i had very little contact with the ranji trophy cricketers throughout my career i still haven't uh, had much contact with the ranji trophy cricketers i have not set foot or played a game on the maharashtra uh, stadium at gaunze just outside of pune uh, it was all kind of very separate in the bcci times but back then they took the initiative and put themselves in these kind of situations where they know that they will learn and they will improve as cricketers and so to that extent that's probably that's what i know of uh, where she would pick up these things from of course she's played international cricket not like you know uh, someone who's afraid to talk to the opposition learn from them she picked up a lot when uh, she went abroad and in fact people abroad used to watch her train and pick up a lot from her like i said you know she's always been the one who's uh, in that kind of situation but always acing that situation but i mean to find out really where she picked it up is a really good question and i should pick her brain about it at various points yeah i mean hope to see her on your show sometime actually uh, since you do have a youtube channel and you're right there in pune you kind of mentioned the bit about how you could sometimes be diffident and lack confidence and all of that and she told you no you got to be fair some you're a 6 foot fast bowler you know and uh, all of that do you think that that you know the kind of approach that you take to the sport also then changes what you are outside the sport like if you are finding yourself finding increased confidence within the field and you're being fearsome as it were and bowling bouncers and hitting people and all of that uh, which i presume all fast bowlers uh, enjoy doing but did that also rub off then on the kind of person you are because i just find that in any field not just sort of the sport but in absolutely any field the kind of work you do can often impact the kind of person you become you know like even podcast i just find that having these long conversations has kind of changed me a little bit better listener more empathetic so on and so forth so you, you know is there something to that not just from your own experience but kind of seeing people around you I think there's a little bit uh, both ways. Um my own experience has I mean yes playing sport and you know always being with the uh, the only girl in the boys and never letting it kind of bother me did probably contribute to the um the little bit of an extrovertness that I have and you know the comfort or of, of starting a conversation or being in a in a situation which might make other people nervous in that sense so in that sense playing sport um does help uh, in terms of the person you uh, are and the person you become but i mean there's this old adage in the in any sport is that you know sports doesn't really build character it reveals it so more than anything i think it's the other way around i think the person you are contributes more to the kind of 
this is my experience uh, the person you are contributes more to the kind of athlete or the kind of sports person you become because you can't i mean like sports is the match is somewhere where it kind of reveals your true personality and you can't fake it there when you're tired and there is no energy left in your body to put up a pretense the only reserves of energy you have are what are going to be used in uh, doing whatever action you need to do there i think it shows who you really are and is an opportunity for reflection and is opportunity to learn and you know for uh, many years i just went through sport without really actively learning and without taking those opportunities to really reflect and really think because like i said there were a little bit of hesitancies in my personality despite on the outside being this super confident tall extrovertish kind of person who is you know happy to pick up any kind of conversations there are always some insecurities that you have uh, insecurities that you pick up which then kind of express themselves on the field because more than anything i think the person you are contributes in a big way to the athlete you become which is why you know having talent is not enough everyone says you have to have the right mindset for it the right attitude for it i think that is a part or that is speaking to this aspect of the conversation where you have you know a person like me can be gifted physically but my mindset was it the best no i mean was it the best for a professional athlete no i'll be like now looking back i can be completely honest with myself at the time i hadn't really figured myself out in what way was your mindset not up to the task so um so growing up there were a few insecurities which were coming out of my childhood there were a few body image insecurities uh which were kind of carrying forth onto the cricket field they were all rooted into the sense of you know am i good enough and rooted into the questions of self worth so therefore when there is a situation where you need to make the brave choice my internal dialogue was am i good enough and my internal dialogue was that of a doubt so like you mentioned the example of you know uh, when i was hesitating where i could have should have gone up had a conversation maybe it would have helped my career worst come to worst it would have just you know been a i would have had to hear a no in those moments i hesitated doubted myself that as a cricketer is kind of really uh, it can be fatal because you're in a situation where you're uh, the team depends on you you're in a situation where you have to perform a difficult task it's easy at the start you know when the going is good the energy levels are high but should i bowl that slower ball now oh what if it gets hit maybe i'll just stick to my regular stock ball should i take a risk and play this shot oh but uh, what if i get out those are the kind of internal dialogues and internal doubts that can sometimes come across if you have those kind of insecurities and internal dialogues off the field if you have those kind of uh, things as a part of your personality so to speak and sh- sure oh, the process of going through those kind of things it does help but in my opinion that and i say this now also to you know younger people in the field whether it's in media or whether it's in sports is that your personal development is probably the biggest obstacle to your professional development and uh, that is kind of my take away from the career that i had is that if i had uh, for example my mindset towards professionalism just taking the plunge and being much more professional about how i saw it was difficult for me because maybe i was limiting myself with what i could be like my mentors kept telling me you can aim for this you uh, should aim for this in my mind uh, if there is a voice saying can i can i really can i believe that and then only once you believe that can you apply the steps required to kind of reach there so thinking back now i mean at the time i had zero idea but uh, thinking back now i mean hindsight is a wonderful thing that is something i would have encouraged a 20 22 year old snail pradhan to change i have a ten- tangential question like i used to play chess a little seriously in my uh, teens and at one point i think when i was 19 i just stopped because i realized i'm not good enough to be an anand and anything else just kind of makes no sense but just looking back at those days i realized that all my issues with why i wasn't able to take the next next step were not talent issues but temperament issues again similar things to what you've mentioned impatience and uh, always in a hurry and similar to those things now 
A, I wonder that if someone had actually, if an older me had sat down and told me, these are your problems, this is how you need to get past it, this is why it will stop you, whether I would have learned at all. And, and you know, whether people just need to make their own mistakes and go through their own phases and you can't actually teach them. Like on the one hand, I would imagine that having a mentor or having a coach can really help you because you don't make these mistakes you would otherwise have made. But the other aspect of it is that these mistakes perhaps come from deep inside, perhaps they're part of your character and you just need to grow grow on your own. Now, you're a coach where you're working with young people all the time and you're seeing kind of similar uh, sort of tendencies. So, you know, would it be the case that like technical defects you can coach out of people, but just kind of the mentality and all of these other issues, is there a way for someone like you to accelerate the growing up process? Because, you know, uh, instilling, say, patience or discipline in someone is not just changing them as a, a, a sports person, but also changing them as a person in a sense. Can that be accelerated? accelerated what's your experience working with younger snails as i'm sure you do yeah that's that's an interesting question and um, like i had uh, one student who i was working one on one with and um, i emphasized this a lot with her um, as you know a young teenage girl naturally there are definitely a lot of insecurities so i emphasized uh, self knowledge is one of the skills that we're trying to build here and that extends beyond cricket I want like, you know, some of the things that I'll say in coaching is that I want you to understand your body as to when your arm comes so far away from your uh, head, then where the ball will go. And when your uh, body pivots so well, then where the ball will go. I want you to understand those things about your body. I want you to understand that, you know, when you're holding the bat in which exact position do you, are you able to connect the ball well? Um, so that kind of self-knowledge, that technical self-knowledge is important, yes. But I also encourage her to journal. I also encourage her to kind of write down her thoughts. Um, I also encourage her to talk to her uh, near and dear ones about the things that you might, uh, you know, not usually talk to, to have those conversations. And um, as someone who is providing that guidance, you can help. But it's absolutely true that everyone has their own journey. Everyone has their own path. I am 100% convinced that if you don't have this mentor in your life, that path takes a lot longer. But even with the mentor in your life, uh, they can't walk it for you. You have to be the one. But there are, for example, like when you talk about cricket, some exercises that you do, which make it easier to perform technical actions. Like unless you're strong in your shoulders, you won't be able to rip the ball uh, when you're bowling it at a certain speed. So similarly, some exercises that you do can help you in your personal growth like for example things like meditation disconnecting from your phone social media journaling these are exercises which aren't going to solve the problem for you but hopefully give you either skills or insights to for you to kind of solve and recognize those problems yourself so as a coach you can provide those structures and hope that those structures can develop into self realization and self knowledge for uh, whoever you're working with. And I mean, it's a process that we have to do ourselves. I mean, as coaches constantly, but it it can help. But like you said, it, it is up to the individual. Some, some individuals will just pick it up faster. Some individuals will take a lot of time with it. I want to pick up on your mention of social media there. Like I imagine at the time you started playing, like you said, there weren't too many of you. Today, I guess a pool of people wanting to play would be larger. But at the same time, so are the distractions and so is the opportunity cost in terms of what else they could be doing with their time. And, you know, there is Facebook, which I think today renamed itself to Meta. So I have to stop using that word. But Facebook um, many years ago did a study which found, uh, which they suppressed, which found that social media had a negative impact on the uh, sort of the mental health of young teenage girls specifically and and Jonathan Haidt on the episode of another show that I produced at one point elaborated a little bit on this and what studies have kind of found is that you know people a decade and a half back thought that video games would be bad for boys but it turned out boys playing video games was perfectly fine because problem solving skills and all of that it was okay for them but for the girls the social media became a big problem because typically if you're a young adolescent or pre-adolescent girl you have girls hanging around being social getting to know each other but social media made everything performative with all the pressures of looking your best on Instagram and Facebook and so on and so forth. And that led to a rise in uh, teenage depression and suicides in the US. And it's, it's something that's been spoken a, 
lot about and the artist formerly known as Facebook but now known as Meta kind of um, apparently suppressed uh, research that they had uh, to that effect that it was uh, correct they're, they're thereby confirming what a lot of people were saying. So when you coach young people do you feel that that is also a problem that there are all these distractions or does it mean that the people who've come to you for coaching in any case by a process of self-selection are the people who are the most driven anyway? I would firstly say that I don't have enough sample size to answer this question because I usually coach on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And, you know, if, if I'm in charge of a team of uh, young girls or, you know, in a big academy, then it will probably be uh, give me a bigger picture. Two, like you said, the students who do come to me are the ones who are serious. They are the ones whose parents are ready to invest a significant amount of time driving them to and from wherever they are. They are the ones whose uh, parents are ready to invest fees. So they're already convinced that this is something that they want to get serious about. So when I tell them to stay off their phones at night or, you know, or give them social media uh, related advice, they're usually more likely to follow it. In general, yes, social media does definitely has thrown up, does throw up so many new challenges, which we're kind of figuring out how to do. I mean, a constant, I mean, even when I was playing, that is five, six years ago until I retired, conversations on social media within the women's cricket circuit were quite uh, common. You know, it is uh, an oft repeated fact in the women's cricket circuit that Ellie Sperry is not on any social media. And... She's there because she's at the level that she's at right now because she is uh, recognized that, you know, to get there requires a certain amount of focus, requires a certain amount of sacrifice, requires amount of subtraction from your life. And now it's only now that she's achieved what she's achieved that she started on Instagram or a Twitter or whatever it is. So that is something that, you know, does get repeated. There is a general grumbling that the younger generation uses social media too much, but I'm not close enough to this problem to kind of uh, prob properly comment on it. I mean, in my in my life, social media is a also a huge distraction, but also a huge asset. I mean, my entire brand, so to speak, has been built on social media. I mean, I'm not the kind of player who played 100 tests. And therefore, I had to assert my credibility almost through my work on social media. It's my, my playing career doesn't speak for itself. So... Yeah, it 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 work, can work both ways, but I recognize that. I mean, in, in my life, I spent too much time on Twitter. <laughs> in my life, I spent too much time on Twitter as well, and I can I can also rationalize by saying that no, listen, that's where I, I reach out to people and I'm connected with readers or listeners or whatever. But at some level, that's kind of a cop out. Now, earlier you mentioned the role of happenstance, and I remember this uh, line that really uh, struck me from uh, the Fire Burns Blue by Karunia and Sidhyant, which I'll uh, read out. It says, "Quote: If today's women's uh, cricket is a community, it's because of Shanta Rangaswamy. If it is competitive, it's because of Diana Adulji uh, helping it take." that vital step towards professionalism was a vision, efficiency and diplomacy of Shubhangi Kulkarni, stop quote. And again, it's happenstance that one of these three sort of pioneers who played such a big role was a big part of your life and you got to benefit from that and many other people kind of wouldn't have, which is great luck. But also another stroke of luck that um, you've also had a recent video about was uh, your parents in the sense that they were so supportive through everything. And you just mentioned about how a lot of the kids who come to you, their parents are a big part of it. They'll drive them they're from far places and all of that. And that can be a little bit of a double-edged sword, right? On the one hand, you're passionate about something and it's great if your parents support you. And they're not going the conventional way saying, you know, do medical or engineering or MBA, but they support you. That's great. But the flip side of that also is, as we've seen in in the past is that parents can sometimes push you too hard. You know, they can kind of want to live vicariously through you and all of that. And that can also be sort of a problem with kids. So uh, what are your thoughts on this? Before answering that question, I must point out that I was lucky enough to spend a lot of time around not one, but two of those uh, great pioneers. Because in when I was 21, I uh, got employed with Western Railway, the senior sports officer at Western Railway, the woman in charge of everything, not just cricket, but all sports, was Diana Adelji, and who went on to play a huge role in cricket administration later. And my God, what a force that woman uh, is, really. Uh, not even was. So lucky enough, like you said, that happenstance had these two people who were kind of driving women's cricket forward in their own different way. To come to the question about parents, it's definitely a, a thing that you have these parents who are a little too over-involved. I luckily didn't. Like I said, my entire family is, you know, this 
a family where education is fairly important. My parents actually split up when I was about 13 or 14, but despite that, we still lived in the same building. So they were still sharing the kind of responsibilities of making sure that my cricket is always taken care of. That was never compromised on. What has been probably, again, lucky for me is that since they didn't really have like sporting aspirations of their own, uh, they never imposed their aspirations or their dreams on me and kind of let me take my uh, own path. Like I said, I moved I joined Western Railway in uh, when I was 21 and at that point I moved out of home. I moved from Pune to Mumbai. Again, uh, wonderful support from both my parents in that respect and uh, the entire family, not just uh, my father and my mother. So I can't really speak for the people whose parents can be too overbearing with coaches or with uh, children who I teach, children who I work with. I kind of make it clear to the parents that you will drop the kid to uh training but then you're kind of out of bounds out of after that all yours but i don't want a parent coming and telling that oh she should do this she should do that because the hey karat nahi the te karat nahi she doesn't do this or doesn't do that i don't want that happening in my coaching so that's a line that i draw i've been lucky that i've worked with parents that kind of understand that it's something that I drive through in my online coaching programs also. I've like now built an online coaching program which is designed specifically for parent-children combination. So this is I'm all my target audience almost is these parents that you're talking about who want to invest a hundred balls a day, who want to bowl a thousand balls a day to their kid. And almost, you know, they might be having cricketing aspirations of their own and they want to see their kids uh, fulfill those. I always try and convey that, you know, cricket is not everything. Please do other things, play other sports, read in a subtle way. I try to convey that there is more to life than cricket. In fact, I mean, part of that online training program that I'm trying to build, I'm trying to uh, build a series of educational programs on, you know, what you can do as in how you can get a job in cricket if you don't make it as a cricketer. Because the fact is that 95%, 97%, 99% of people aren't going to make it as cricketers. So, how can you uh, how can you be as lucky as i was and you were able to stay connected to cricket as a part of your profession even after um, actually quitting the game is something that i'm hoping to build out in the future so i try it's not something i uh, actively talk about or it's not something i kind of uh, try to shout through but in subtle ways i try to just encourage them that this is also something you could do and also make them aware that you know Despite our best efforts, that dream may not be fulfilled. Okay, that's okay. When I was going through your website, one of the fascinating things was you have these separate buttons side by side where, you know, one for children to click and one for parents to click if they want to learn, which is fascinating. And also this aspect of figuring out stuff outside cricket, like CLR James said, what do they of cricket know who only cricket know? I, I have another question for you because you mentioned Diana Edulji and what a remarkable woman she was. And this takes me back to a, a thought I had while recording my episode with Kavita Rao, where she's uh, she's written this wonderful book on these uh, women doctors of the 19th century. And one of the things that struck me there was that just to be a woman doctor in the 19th century, you had to be prima facie absolutely remarkable because it wasn't just a question of the aptitude or the interest in the subject, but you also had to have the massive will to make it through all the obstacles in your way. Similarly, it struck strikes me that as far as these cricketing pioneers are concerned, including the three people we just mentioned and the two people you've, who've in a sense uh, mentored you, it kind of strikes me that, you know, that there is that intersection of great talent and great will that is very rare. And in women's cricket, you have to have that. And in men's cricket, you possibly don't. That you, you know, just by having great talent and being in the right place at the right time, you can make it to a fairly high level. But in women's cricket, with all the obstacles, deciding to stick with it, deciding not to do any of the hundred other things that you can do, it's, it's kind of crazy. And is that something that you see still today? I mean, I, I'm pretty sure it's true of the pioneers. And also, you know, when you mentioned that, you know, uh, Dan Adulji was a remarkable woman and all of that. Expand on that a little bit. I'd love to know. So going to slightly disagree with you there is that even in men's cricket, I don't think you can make it nowadays just because of the sheer volumes and the competition that we have without both those great talent and great will. But in terms of what is required at at a pioneer stage, that's literally the job description of a pioneer, I suppose. You know, whether it's in women's cricket or whether it's in 
the freedom struggle or uh, any kind of uh, field which where they're breaking glass ceilings i have i have this saying which i i sadly have to agree with is that you know people who break glass ceilings often have bloody fists and it's especially true i think of uh, some of the pioneers of the women's cricket generation because they gave up so much in terms of what they had to go through to simply play the sport that they loved i mean i remember you would have read this in the book there's an incident where uh, shantaranga swami was protesting against some mismanagement by the administration and she was dropped she was like simply dropped from the team uh, similarly dana delchi has pushed through so much to build up the legacy that the indian railways really has she is the first women's cricketer to be employed by railways and she's the start of that legacy where she where she really put her name forward to a, a politician at the time saying that my father is retiring from western railway i would like to take his place because there was this system of you know almost uh, compensatory employment and she then just worked and worked and worked to have more and more cricketers employed so like you know what we hear feminists say nowadays that if you get an opportunity you should do your best to make sure that that opportunity is also available to the next generation of women who come after you before feminism really existed in the indian consciousness these women were doing it and at the time great social cost because you are putting yourself almost as a villain in many cases for to fight the case of women's cricket against very often male dominated situations and it's 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 not going to be easy at all in terms of my own experience with uh, dyna ma'am she was always this extremely senior figure and i was just joining western railway in the early 20s what would used to happen is that she was posted in the office at church gate of course that's the headquarters for western railway I was posted at Bombay Central but one month of the year we would all spend at Churchgate where we were handling the railway recruitment drives the entire women's cricket team would kind of be recruited to just help out with that work and we would see her literally having phone calls uh, constantly having meetings constantly to make sure that you know western railway remained the top ra- railway in terms of sports whether it's berating some coach who has not done his job or whether it's uh making calls to make sure that this team is being transported here in the best possible arrangements uh western railway always she pushed for the best talent the best kind of accommodation whenever our inter railway tournaments used to happen she would always travel with us for inter railway because i mean we were her team if we didn't do well then it was a matter of pride for her and nothing less than winning is acceptable is the culture that she built out at western railway and there are some downsides to that culture yes absolutely but the expectations the high expectations that were set was uh, something that she did very rigorously and we had a kind of there was a there was an aura of fear usually around her because you do not want to get on her bad side because we would be sitting in those offices and of course they're not like sealed glass cabins which are soundproof you know i can just still imagine those uh, thin walled uh, western railway offices where the upper sections of the high ceiling are just open and everything that is being spoken inside is carrying out and you will hear her sometimes tearing into someone who is not performed as per expectations i mean i remember once i picked up an injury which she wasn't very happy about and oh my god that was an uncomfortable conversation but also this fears admiration for someone who you knew would kind of have your back and make sure that you had the best in terms of coaching in terms of uh, facilities available for the railways in terms of the kinds of leaves that we were able to get and um to the extent that western railway was very often the envy of uh, pretty much every other team because we had someone fighting for us someone in our corner so i can imagine it's a it's a great tragedy that we don't have records we don't have any kind of visual evidence of very little photos photographic evidence of some of these players in their prime and you look at them now when they are in their 50s and their 60s and still they are so impressive and definitely as players you would think you know would have been very interesting to be in the same team as them never a dull moment
it's uh, really interesting to me that your first class cricket really uh, uh, the equivalent of first class cricket in for w- women really started in the 70s but eventually railways was like the dominant team because it just employed all the best players so it just tells you kind of the force of one woman in building an ecosystem and what difference just one person can sometimes we make i think they won 19 out of 20 tournaments uh, or something like that till a particular point in time let's let's kind of get back to your sort of career now that you, you know you're this young teenager you go to the nets you want to be a wicket keeper they make you a fast bowler you find out you're good at it and uh, then uh, amrita shinde joins in 2006 and that kind of uh, helps you along and in 2008 you make your debut uh, uh, you know and eventually you're bowling alongside uh, julan goswami i think in your, in your first odi you took uh, three wickets while she took two so tell me a little bit about what that experience was like actually playing for the national team so um let me build up a little bit to that uh, in you know recognizing what led to that finally happening in terms of a uh, 2006 bcci coming over we're playing on better grounds better facilities all those kind of things we no longer living in dormitories no longer traveling unreserved instead we're traveling ac buses planes and living in twin sharing oh my god twin sharing so cool that kind of a shift at the same time we're now exposed to a much higher standard of cricket thanks to players who were playing for the likes of Air India coming back into the Maharashtra team that helped uh, you know just make one step up 2007 like i said i joined railways and western railways western railway was the strongest team on the circuit playing in that environment where suddenly i'm not the meanest bowler on the pitch and you know there are batters who have out of the top 6 batters four would have played for india and pitting myself against them also then accelerated my development and of course being in western railway and having a little more structured training etc and then the call came it it wasn't even a call i mean the whole process of you know informing people of their selection is just so poorly managed in india i didn't expect to be picked for the series that i was picked for which was the asia cup in uh, sri lanka in 2008 Uh, we had had a camp before that i had done okay okay but you know it wasn't really a breakthrough performance but obviously the selectors saw some talent they decided to take a chance on it i was at home got a message from one of the players saying that oh congrats and like ah for what then uh, suddenly you know the internet has made its appearance in a live go check websites and i actually see my name there which is uh, really cool i had gotten a little bit of a taste of what it would be like to receive an kind of an india cap a few years earlier when i had played for india under 21 where um, we had gone to pakistan but actually arriving there we were given this box a few days before our departure which at the time nike was sponsoring the bcci i'm i'm like still in in nike kit i've just like had a sports session this morning so i'm still in kit and there's this box of nike packaging which we can take to our rooms and open and we're all going through it and we find our caps our india caps there's there was no culture of or no no paddhat of uh, cap presentation and all you know you, you got your india cap now wear it and come on to the field uh, was the kind of situation i remember the first training session we had in sri lanka i was so sick from some kind of food poisoning i was vomiting on the ground uh, wasn't really able to practice at all almost blacking out and i was like oh shit what a bad way to make a first impression and then finally stomach settled down nerves settled down and we got in the that match that you're talking about wasn't actually actually my first match for india there was another match before that against bangladesh but at the time bangladesh didn't have odi status so therefore it doesn't count as an official odi it doesn't count as my first match but that was my first match against bangladesh the second match was against pakistan to do well in both those matches was nice to hear mithali raj say you know standing at mid off and saying no you bowl your full 10 overs uh to have her show that kind of confidence in me was really cool for uh, a young cricketer to you know go to the dressing room afterwards and ask juludi juludi how did i do and to hear that you know yeah he did well you can do better to get that kind of direct encouragement and feedback was uh, incredible and i remember on that tour juludi actually uh, i think she completed the landmark of 100 wickets so being on that tour being a part of that was uh, another special feeling there were there are very few people on the women's cricket circuit who i've connected on a wavelength with and uh, like fortunately for me one of the people i looked up to was one of them juludi was one of them and uh, she's uh, she had this at 
at one at the same time competitiveness extreme competitiveness but at the same time this ability to you know take the focus off herself and guide the younger players and again i keep saying this it uh, keeps popping up but i almost wonder whether it how much energy she must have be pouring and still from what these kids say pouring into the current crop of younger cricketers and just despite that she's just an amazing cricketer and the cricketer that she is is uh, is amazing so overall getting to fulfill that dream was an incredible experience um where you know you have a dream of opening the bowling for with julian goswami for india um got to do that and that was pretty cool yeah and her longevity is also amazing for a fast bowler like you know to to give almost 20 years is kind of crazy so so that 3 for 21 you took in uh, the game against pakistan was the, it was at one stretch you th- those ten overs yeah those ten overs as far as i remember I mean, i'll have to check ball by ball to be sure but uh, as far as i remember those ten overs were at a stretch <laughs> wow, that's crazy. I, I mean, that is really uh, kind of uh, tough uh, physically. I mean, you know, just in terms of physical conditioning. By this time, I guess you had proper coaches and all of that. And g- give me a sense from a fast bowling perspective, how different approaching a match is for a fast bowler as opposed to a batsman, for example, or even a spinner. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the spinners are the the they have the easiest job, but. for me that had kind of become something i'd been known for on the domestic circuit you know in the few seasons leading up to uh, playing for india and uh, at that time uh, i had become a bit of a new ball specialist i had become someone who can uh, who regularly will bowl uh, 10 overs up front to the new ball so it wasn't down to any kind of specific training regime it was probably just a lot of bowling you know we hear these two schools of thought nowadays within cricket one is that you know you have your workload management is that bowl only x number of balls per week per day and then you do the rest of your miles in your cardio or something and we didn't have any of those concepts we it was just sheerly bowling in the nets for almost an hour or 15 minutes is how we used to kind of build up that kind of bowling fitness despite having a few coaches here and there there was only probably uh, one other coach in the um, state setup who had you know shown that they have a very high level of knowledge but i had not yet met someone who was able to uh, impress as a coach even in my first few years as western in western railway but just training with a team like western railway where we were putting in a little more hours in terms of uh, what we were doing there was a gym there so i was uh, doing gym work properly for the first time in my life i had been doing some gym before that we had this tradition of going for weekly runs to juhu beach and we would head there and reach there by sunrise and do a 45 minute sometimes one hour long distance run so these very old fashioned training methods no real knowledge about nutrition no real knowledge about recovery no dedicated time energy resources to really do this just try and have as much you know regular home food as you can that was kind of how it went back then in terms of preparation for matches one one challenge of you know bowling those 10 overs at a stretch for me i am someone who sweats a lot i mean they used to call me the rahul dravid of the women's cricket team that much no one would hug me after i took a wicket let's just say that <laughs> and one of the big challenges was cramps one of the big challenges was especially training a lot in mumbai very often playing in uh, hot humid conditions was cramps so hydration even though there was very little knowledge of nutrition and those kind of things hydration became something that i paid a lot of attention to so a day before the match my hydration would start a day before the match i would have my uh my favorite brand of ors mixed into a bottle ready uh and i would kind of consume the entire quota a day before the game uh during the game everyone knew this is poppy's bottle poppy i mean my nickname during the my playing years was pot, uh, was poppy <laughs> so this is poppy's bottle everyone knew no one else touched that and every opportunity whether it's you know a small pause in the game someone will come uh, the 12th uh, 12th man will come inside and run uh, me drinks so that was something that i always constantly was conscious of worked on it was always i mean i marveled at all rounders you know i looked at people who were proper fast bowling all rounders i'm like how did you do it because it was exhausting let's be honest that kind of training that kind of preparation 
Of course, by that time I was also working in Western Railway, so I had to spend half a day in an office where all you want to do is curl up and sleep, rather than you know going through dusty old files and having to sort them alphabetically, only to find out two days later that it's all been jumbled up. <laughs> that kind of experience was exhausting. So I really had no concept of how these all rounders did it. How people who were Rumeli Dhar, for one example, I mean, fantastic all rounder for India. regularly bowled 8 10 overs and batted at you know 4 5 6 in the middle order and i i marveled at that but it was at that stage incomprehensible to me i was just about able to kind of pour all my energies into bowling uh, it got me to that stage that it did yeah i think rumeli speaking of rumeli dhar uh, she i think made a quick fire of 50 at more than a run a ball in that particular match against pakistan Tell me a bit about a railway thing because my impression was you get a sports quota job. You're basically playing sports, but you also no, no. had to go to office and look through files. Like, what was your work there? Oh, that was such a phase in life. Um, because I mean, uh, Dana Idol G was there. She had kind of created a system where you know new players coming in had a place to stay in Mumbai. So that first struggle of you know where to stay in Mumbai wasn't as big a struggle in terms of finding that place. Getting used to that place was a different issue because it was a railway quarter in uh, Matunga, the Matunga Western Line station, uh, right next to it. Still, when you pass from Matunga to Mahim and you look on your right, you will see those probably blue and white painted houses. You know, once upon a time, I used to live in one of those houses where we are bang next to the railway tracks, which is why I mean, hearing uh, just the train sounds in Mumbai is just a part of my psyche, I suppose. And we are seven people in that flat. We are seven girls, all girls from the women's cricket team, staying in that flat. It's literally two rooms and a kitchen, and everyone has different schedules. There is no real furniture. We're sleeping on bed rolls on the floor. we were using that place as you know just to crash essentially i was lucky enough that i could i was close by enough to go to bombay on the go to pune on the weekends etc and enjoy home comforts but uh, moving to mumbai living in that kind of place after you know experiencing pune and mumbai anyways the amount of space you have available to use so very different then commuting every day like our routine was almost sometimes if we're doing twice a day training Leave uh, Matunga at around six thirty. By seven fifteen, travel to Lower Parel, where the Western Railway ground is at Mahalakshmi, which is opposite Phoenix Mills and High Street Phoenix, which is now High Street Phoenix. There, seven fifteen to eight fifteen nine, have a morning session. Whether that's fitness, whether that is a gym, whether whatever is happening at that phase in time, use the dormitories there to bathe, change, head to office, get to office by ten a.m. Stay in office, torturous three hours, and leave at one p.m. So the the facility that we received was half day. Being a sports quota athlete, you could basically you had to go to the office half day, leave at one. The stories that you hear of you know people being signed on sports quota and then just never having to turn up are either stories of extremely elite athletes who set conditions that you know okay sorry we're not going to turn up in an office ever. and the railways wants them so bad that they accept those conditions or people whose offices can be managed whose offices are you know cooperative enough to yeah okay fine don't come that's okay because everyone finally is posted into an office and you're under a particular boss totally depends on how that boss is with regards to how you are how much workload that space has i mean within western railway people who are posted at headquarters church gate usually had very less workloads people who were posted uh, like me at uh, bombay central uh, in working in the bombay div- division not headquarters division had very high workloads so we had no such allowances there were of course a lot of uh, our uh, players who worked at who worked as uh, tcs and uh, they didn't have weekends off they had only one day off a week that may not even be on a saturday sunday they would actually be in trains checking tickets so that sometimes was like a good thing or a bad thing because you're kind of on the fly it's easy to fly away when you're on the fly and then after 1 pm have food usually outside somewhere uh, and head back to mahalakshmi the dormitories there had beds so we would usually catch an afternoon nap uh, for an hour and then 4 to 6 pm training again 6 pm get back and travel back to matunga It took us about half an hour 45 minutes uh, 7 7:30 back have food and if you have any any energy left for any recreation 
that's that's the time you got and that was the kind of routine that we had that was the kind of routine that i lived for a, a very long time when i was living in that flat eventually i moved out and uh, lived with friends but it is a very different kind of life but at the same time the everyone exist everyone accepted that it is a very normal life for women's cricketers i mean just at any point of time in that flat there was at least two india cricketers there uh, i think when i was there there were four four out of the seven had played for india so that was what an india cricketer's life is like wow and at this point how are you sort of thinking about your life ahead because you know there is a game but at the same time uh, the, the indian team just isn't playing so much so you know it's not like you're going to play a 100 test matches you know it, it, it's just not there obviously I, i i'm guessing you're not thinking that oh i want to be in railways all my life this is a great life so how are you kind of thinking of life outside of cricket after cricket and so on to be honest i mean in those early years i'm not thinking about after cricket because i mean just the hope is that you know you can make uh, as much of this life as possible and stay in cricket and continue to play at a high level for as long as you can uh, you quickly realize that that's not always possible there is you know at that time so much uh, insecurity in the team so much inconsistency and arbitrariness in selection absolutely no concept of you know nurturing a player i mean thinking back right now if i was an administrator and i had a female bowler who was 6 feet tall i would be making sure that i nurture that bowler and there were a f- there were two or three of us who were uh, you know uh, physically gifted like that i would be making sure that i nurture that player and having her as a uh, kind of a backup and a succession for julan goswami there was absolutely no thought like that because you have to remember after the bcci took over women's cricket something changed for the better like i described before but something changed for the worse we were no longer the number one priority of the association who was governing us so uh, you know whether there was a coach whether there was a national team program national team coaches also were on a revolving musical chair so that's the context that's the environment that we are kind of in and we just it's an environment of survival rather than prosperity you know you can't think about flourishing you're just thinking about keeping your head above the water and this is for the the few of us who are lucky enough to have government jobs salaries you know having already come close to or having played for india even we are kind of going through that kind of a mindset or at least i was i won't speak for the others but that was the little a little glimpse of the environment i always knew at the back of my mind that i'm not going to stay with railways beyond my cricketing years i had no idea what i would do absolutely none but it was just a it was an existence of hope that you continue to stay continue to survive hopefully get opportunities to uh, play at the international level if not you have the fact that there is a railway job who is kind of the, the railway job is supporting you which is good but there is a little bit of a of a uh, adriftness to that existence even if you are playing for india like you said there aren't a lot of matches happening three or four tournaments a year when uh, the next tournament happens whether the coach will be the same whether the selectors will still think the same about you an atmosphere of insecurity despite the security of these public se- sector jobs because you knew that there was no option besides the railways it's not like i could like my i had office mates in chess and table tennis and badminton and all of them could jump from railways to petroleum if railways didn't treat them right or you know move to like a bank whereas women's cricket railways is the only employer so there wasn't an abundance of options either so it was this it was this strange time and i'm glad that a lot of cricketers today don't have to or if they're good enough they don't have to kind of go through that kind of time uh, despite being grateful to the railways i mean let's be really clear if not for that railway job i would probably have quit cricket after my graduation um, i turned down engineering but i did a bsc and in my third year i was thinking about you know higher education okay how many years can you take keep taking money from your parents from to uh, continue playing cricket which might give you absolutely nothing in the future railways kept me in the game otherwise i would have gone off maybe done an mba and be sitting in some corporate office right now railways kept me in the game but at the same time it's uh, it's something which um, a few colleagues of mine describe as uh, limiting ambitions by being in that environment thank god you ended up not doing an mba and there there are plenty of mbas out there that's also the survivorship bias so there might be other people who who made the same decisions as you who might kind of regret making those decisions and not going in for that mba so i guess that's there so during this period and 
obviously you know in women's cricket matches are simply not happening enough like in the fire turns blue there is a stroke of how between you know half a generation was lost because between 86 and 91 there were just no games you know uh, so half a generation was just lost and couldn't play international cricket and so on and you know which is kind of one of those uh, tragic losses like we speak of vino mankad's lost years during world war 2 but those kind of gaps are just so common in women's cricket and obviously that affected you also in the sense that you didn't really play that many games till you eventually Uh, bowed out in um, uh, 2012, but you you also spoke about you know if you were an administrator, you would have nurtured a young Snehal better than what actually happened. So what really went wrong? Like where do you feel nurturing would have helped? Like you know where did you go wrong? With my own uh, career, yeah. So one thing was I remember having this comparative uh, example uh, thrown about. I think this was the 2009 World Cup where we were all in Australia. and there was um, i think we had gone there for a series before we were playing australia in 2008 and there was a launch event you know like a press event for the upcoming 2009 world cup and there were some representatives from some of the top countries isha goa was there for england the australians of course i think um, so suzy bates must have been there from new zealand and i remember at the time hearing or learning that england had kept the same team for the last 4 years they had had that kind of vision that you know if we're going to uh, do well in the world cup we need to give a lot of match experience to the players who we select so they had essentially selected their world cup team practically 4 years before and by the time they came into that world cup all of their playing 11 and their key players had played about 50 odis yeah so i remember that i am thinking i'm so jealous of that i'm i'm so jealous of the fact that you know uh, what i had heard at the time was these players are told that you know even if you get four ducks in a row you're going to be in the team i was like i'm so jealous of that because i am constantly um, in this environment where despite doing well i might get dropped i mean the 2009 world cup i didn't play a single game the next world cup that was happening after that i wasn't in the team there was like a domestic tournament before that i did okay but you know you would think that you would hold on to your place unless you get knocked off at the international level at least so much arbitrariness in selections i mean there was one phase where india caps were being just handed out in a, in a slightly ill manner and it's this kind of an environment that makes it difficult i'm and i'm not going to sit here and blame the environment just the environment and you know not say that i could have done better i'm I've already said that looking back i wish that i had taken the game more professionally i had uh, trained uh much more i had played lot more matches outside of what you know india or maharashtra were providing to me which are a lot, lot of things that i did in the kind of latter half of my domestic cricket career and saw value in that but you know at the time like we said we were figuring things out uh didn't have this constant coaching always moving from okay now you're at the western railway coach now you're at some other coach now you're at some other coach whereas nowadays every player you hear at the top level comes to the top level because they've had this constancy in coaching they've had you know one person who's kind of they always can go back to that one person which uh, really wasn't there for me so there was no shortage of hard work but there was these other things which i wish that i had done differently in terms of you know the time where i lost my place in the uh, indian team because of the suspect action uh, calling that was in one of those phases where i was very much in between coaches you know who should i be learning from exactly that is one of the things i wish i had gotten sorted a lot uh, earlier in life and the fact is there were there weren't as many people who were becoming personal coaches of women's cricketers uh, back then so that is something where i feel i could have done better in terms of approaching the game more professionally um i kind of got caught up in the railways life and you know i have to keep the people at office also happy i have to make sure i'm doing my best whereas now thinking back i could have thought you know i mean maybe that's just the people pleaser in me thinking that but i could have thought let office go to hell i'm here to play cricket i can play cricket for a finite amount of years i don't care if people in the office are unhappy but i'm going to spend more time on the ground you know maybe that's uh, something that i could have thought but again the environment is such that you're penalized for that kind of thinking i mean if i just drop everything and run and not turn up to office for 5 days i have to go back and face consequences at some point which is i mean things that happened Uh, I at one point got uh, charge sheeted in the office for not turning up uh, when they called me to work on a weekend. 
So well, the, the, the chart sheets, you know, they like. are chart sheets. <laughs> this, is, this is the literal word chart sheets. I can still remember the word sitting on those brown faded paper. Oh my god, Jesus! <laughs> so um, that was uh, it. wasn't It was semi professional environment. We keep talking about you know how India is uh, professional contracts for the top twenty players. Okay, fine. Two thousand fifteen onwards, that existed in in our time. There was no such thing as an India contract. You. Go to one tour, okay. You earn a lot more money that you've ever earned before playing cricket for the BCCI. But suddenly, the next tour that doesn't exist. So that's something that we are aware of. That this kind of there's no constancy, there's no uh, financial support. Besides, you know, I keep complaining, but I have a railways job. Still, I'm thinking like this. I'm kind of stuck in this kind of thinking. So I wish my thinking had been very different. The kind of thinking that now I approach my not just media career but also the career where i'm trying to build my own coaching especially my online coaching the kind of thinking that i'm applying right now the kind of initiative i'm showing in trying to get the kind of guidance that i need i wish i had those kind of attitudes back then but i also recognize that the environment is very different and you have to be like you know some of those pioneers this really driven person to crack that kind of uh, situation and which is why i have serious respect for the likes of you know mithali raj julan goswami and people who have been in this situation and excelled for so long you know one when that happened like around 2012 you were called for a suspect action and your career gradually petered out and you played your last game i think in 2015 so what was that phase like did you feel that you were kind of left alone to fend for yourself not enough support within the system and at what point did you start figuring out that okay this is going to end at some point and i need to think about what i'm going to do beyond that so what was sort of that transitional phase like when you kind of started thinking seriously about what do i do next and also as a general question uh, though we'll talk about women's cricket more in detail after the break but just as a general question when when male cricketers end their careers th- there are often different kinds of post career pipelines that are there they can enter local administrations or those who are fortunate enough can get into media and all these different kind of pipelines are there there are precedents for what uh, people have done and chances are that on average they've actually made more money also so is there something like that is it like i imagine like for all of us you know like my career really probably ends when i drop down dead but for sports people that's not the case for sports people you are kind of in the peak of your physical life when suddenly it's over everything that was the center of your life for so long is just done so is that something in a general sense that you know how have people around you coped with that and in a specific sense how was it like you when you started kind of transitioning it's actually funny that you know the period where uh, after i was called for a suspect action and the one year after that was really difficult but the phase after that maybe the last few years of my domestic career were actually the best cricket that i had, that i had ever played because i had gotten a lot of the things which i wish i had gotten right earlier i had gotten them right later but in the phase of where i was called for suspect action i remember the actual day when uh, the the announcement was made i found out on tv which was terrible i mean i remember being really angry at the media you know usually you guys don't cover women's cricket at all now you're putting it on the headlines just because i've been called for a suspect action i found myself really angry at the media because you know there was this little bit of a stigma around suspect actions before whereas now it's looked at more uh, holistically you know people don't think sunil narayan is a bad person because he had a suspect action whereas there was a little bit of a stigma around you know cheating and all those kind of things around suspect actions a little further back um and therefore it was almost like i was being portrayed on tv as a villain and i i really remember resenting that i really remember being distressed watching the news and Uh, seeing myself on the eight o'clock news in the sports section, I'm like, come on, yar. When India do well at a World Cup, you don't highlight us there. And now, when there's some kind of uh, infamy, uh, immediately you guys wake up. So I remember that it was during a national camp at Bangalore. So in that sense, I had immediate support. I remember Sandeep Patel was the director of the NCA. Uh, the next day, he called me into his office and uh, he told me. you'll be fine in 6 months i said i'm going to do, i'm going to be fine in 3 and that determination was there because it was a near miss kind of a situation they take you to a lab this lab happened to be in perth australia 
where they put electrodes on your arm and you're asked to bowl. Uh, not electrodes, but you know they put those dots of uh, fluorescent uh, dots, which which basically show up on a particular type of camera, and uh, that camera tells you that okay, roughly this ball angle was this much, this ball angle was this much. If the permissible limit is fifteen degrees, my average was about seventeen degrees. So it was just a. I I believed that you know it's just a minor adjustment that needs to be made. Um, strength levels need to be improved to make sure that you know the arm isn't taking. um that much of the load those kind of things some technical adjustments were made and getting my action slightly more uh, round arm so as to not go past vertical uh, which can you know lead to that on top of that i have a naturally hyper extended hel- elbow so not as much as you know the murlis or the shoebs but um, this is something that's fairly common in subcontinental bodies and especially slightly taller longer bodies so therefore the optical impression is just um enhanced when you are uh, watching an action with mm, the naked eye so the immediate support was good because the coaches within that camp we sat down we kind of chalked out a plan the months after that it did take 6 months eventually um you know despite my determination and young bullishness but uh, the months after that were difficult uh, i remember and really appreciate some of the indian team players checking in but i had zero idea who to talk to about the bcci about this i had zero idea who to talk to about my state association about this i kept asking them for answers okay when is there going to be an assessment what is going to happen what are the next steps and there was very little communication eventually there was a review a few months down the line then uh, once we were all confident there was another review uh, at the icc level uh, everything was fine action back into legal status and bowling action cleared but in that time i could not bowl for my state so i was playing for my state as a batter and this was the tricky period because then at one point i lost my lost my spot in the state team as well which you know absolutely zero concept of okay now you're out of the team you'll still be supported you can still come to training you can still we'll still help you with that because you are a valuable member of the state side you've been with the state side for the last 5 6 years as like absolutely zero uh, no such support there was a very much fend for yourself kind of a situation a very um, a situation where you are shown who your real friends are and but eventually i mean just through sheer determination and uh, sticking to the kind of processes that we had mapped out in that first camp as to how we can fix it and working with a coach um while i was out of the camp as well uh, again correcting one of the mistakes of of the past i got back and i mean i'm pretty proud of the second half of that career um so like i wouldn't say my career petered out because i had some of my best years with maharashtra after that yes i didn't play for india again but i i captained uh, india a uh, my last professional game was playing for india a against new zealand so i i was very close to breaking back into the indian team so that part of the journey was uh difficult but at the same time rewarding because like you said you you have to learn from these kind of things and sometimes only when these kind of things happen do you learn so there was definitely a change in my approach towards fitness um towards professionalism also the situation in my western railway office also improved somewhat where i can be away from work a lot more than i could so that helped and i could train a lot more with the coaches and get the kind of match experience that i needed and I mean some of my best spells were in the those 2014 2015 years and I retired in 2015 I had like I said just made it to India A you know felt like I was one step away from one good performance away from making it back to the Indian team but again didn't get selected into the Indian team after that India A game and no idea about you know what women's cricket looks like for the next Uh, rest of the year after that series what's going to happen even that series was just am- announced so last minute um that i remember coming into that camp completely unprepared because we thought we were heading into an off season and suddenly new zealand is visiting that kind of situation no idea when india is going to play next no idea what to kind of build up to besides a vague target of you know the 2017 world cup and this situation where there was a lot of uncertainty so the question is do i want to then Uh, at the age of twenty eight, twenty nine, do I want to continue and give it another couple of years with 
an excruciating amount of hard work that had gotten in gone into those last couple of years which were leading to good performances do i want to do that all over again again with the uncertainty whether i will play for india or not close to 30 uh, selectors usually prefer younger bowlers younger players at that point arbitrariness of selection and those kind of things or whether do i want to give myself some time to look to build a second career and i knew that because i was going to quit railways i had to make a living somehow some other way and therefore whether that is the right time to think about giving myself time to do that and eventually i uh, decided on the latter yeah i mean that that feels like an absolutely agonizing decision like do, do do you sometimes look back and wonder what would have you know had you stayed in the game could things have been different i mean you could have been part of the 2017 team for example you know especially if you know you were bowling at your best at that point in time is that a thought that stays with you or i, I mean i i guess it wouldn't um, come so much because you are extremely successful in what you're doing so uh, you know but it, it, that may not have been the case so is that a thought that sometimes comes to you the counterfactual no i mean uh, i think about it uh, but i don't regret uh, that decision at that time there was also an element of you know um, having played cricket despite being only 28 29 having played cricket for 15 years and at the same time remembering and knowing because of my i suppose family background and this constant awareness that you know railways ke alawa bhi kuch hai that there are other things that uh, can um, you know give me a lot of happiness which are out there i didn't know what those things were also a determination to stay connected to cricket that you know even though i will no longer be playing cricket i'll still be doing something or the other in the game because i mean that was the primary skill i had at you know the stage where i'm retiring again zero idea what i will do also those last few years even though they were successful in terms of what i was getting out they demanded more and more in terms of what i had to put in as a fast bowler there are always going to be a few injuries here and there towards those last that year, last year or so i had uh, developed this uh, weird pain in my ankles where you know after every game i had to put both my feet in a, a bucket of ice so those were all things which were kind of building up and uh, contributing to that decision and it's it's a it's a hard life as a fast bowler as a player who's you know fully committedly professional in an environment which is giving you no guarantee of results and so therefore i don't have uh, any regrets you know i don't think uh, oh whatever i had been at the 2017 world cup because i was at the 2017 world cup <laughs> yeah. in 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 another capacity so um so in 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 a way i don't feel like i've disconnected from the game or given up the game i just feel like i've switched teams um and so it doesn't i don't have regrets about um, how things happened there's also a recognition that like i said i was a very different person from you know the people you would usually find at uh, the women's cricket level where people would think you know the railway job is never something you quit whereas i have no doubt in my mind that this is something i'm not going to do because i knew i could do other things so a lot of people ask me why didn't you take up coaching after you quit because i knew that you know everyone can do coaching but very few people can do what i do with the uh, communication skills that i have with the language skills that i have and so i i knew that i had i had the opportunity to contribute in different ways because i had already gotten a taste of that while i was playing so n- n- like thinking about i never think about the content actually i don't uh, think about i you know that entire time at at the 2017 world cup not once did i think oh my god this could have been me but uh, on the other hand i was thinking oh my god wow i'm here Fabulous. We'll take a quick commercial break, and when we come back on the other side, we'll actually talk about uh, your life after cricket, which, to me, in a sense, is also incredibly um, inspiring and a lot to learn from there. So we'll take a quick commercial break before that. People often say, "Hey, cricket is not such a big sport. Only a few countries take it seriously." Well, let me put it like this: If you were to gather all the cricket fans in the world and make a country out of them, Cricketistan would be one of the biggest countries in the world. And the national app of Cricketistan would be the co-sponsor of this episode, Crick Heroes. For any casual cricketer or cricket fan, Crick Heroes is the final piece of the puzzle as far as cricket apps are concerned. Look, the other apps and websites will give you information, features, data, but you'll be a passive 
consumer of big events. Crick Heroes makes you a participant. Are you a recreational cricketer who wishes there was a record of your performances? Well, Crick Heroes allows players everywhere to record their scorecards in real time. Every match, even a gully match if you want. You can track the arc of your own career and you can track your friends. You can trade cricket related goods and services with them in the Crick Heroes marketplace. You might even find a coach there. 10 million people use Crick Heroes. What's more, so do 38 national boards across the world and many state boards in India so that they can track every game that happens. No talent left behind. So head on over to crickheroes.in and download Crick Heroes now. If you love cricket, you love Crick Heroes. Welcome back to The Scene and the Unseen. I'm chatting with Snehal Pradhan about her rich career. And, you know, before I ask my next question, I got to point out that I was also once reported for a suspect action, unfairly, by none other than Rahul Dravid. Now, I don't actually play any kind of cricket, but this was back in the days when I worked in uh, Cricket for in the mid-2000s. And we used to play office cricket in our corridor with this little ball, which you, you could squeeze a lot. It was like halfway between a plastic ball and a squeezy ball. And I had discovered this technique where by squeezing it a lot, and releasing it just as, you know, uh, whatever I could impart, great forward spin, which made it really fast, right? So Dravid came over once to play with us and I bowled him. My my first ball, I I was trying, you know, kind of a backward spin kind of thing and that was a wide. Next two balls, he was clean bowled when he, in exasperation, he called me Shoy Bakhtar and said, I can't play against you. But the irony was that it was all finger spin. There was no chucking involved. But leaving uh, uh, that aside and in case I gave the impression that I also play cricket no I'd be absolutely useless in a field so kind of moving on from your uh, cricketing career like one of the things that I'm actually excited talking about is this next part because I have been thinking a lot in recent months about creators in general about things like teaching about things like how do you achieve excellence in what you do and there are just so many dimensions to things that you've done in this period um, in, in terms of writing in terms of starting a YouTube channel and making that work, in terms of coaching and not just coaching cricket, but also coaching sports journalism and in terms of doing a commentary in two different languages. So let's start with what actually came first, which I don't know. So, you know, after your cricketing career was done, you know, where did you go next? What happened next? Uh, how were you thinking of what you want to do from now on? So writing came first um, and it happened in parallel with kind of the second half of my cricket career. Uh, There was this, uh, like since school, um, okay, so maybe I should go a little further back. When I was in, uh, like I said, I changed schools at one point. The first school that I was in where we were uh, at living with the joint family was a convent. And, you know, it is this fairly prestigious convent, this really old school, which has been around since my parents' time. My mother went to that school. My father went to the school next to it, which was a boys' convent. Both were run by the same this? institution. St. Joseph's. Okay. St. Joseph's Pashan, where, uh, and next door is uh, Loyola's, where my father went. And St. Joseph's was where my mother went. And they wanted me to get admission and, you know, the whole convent colonial obsession with the their language, you know, you should be able to speak good English from nursery, otherwise you won't get admission kind of situation, um, created an environment at home where we were speaking a lot of English. So despite being a, uh, a Marathi family, despite being a family where, uh, you know, my grandparents had most of their education in Marathi, we were speaking a lot of English at home, mainly to get me into the habit of speaking in English so I would fit into a convent school. Uh, Due to that fact, I've always had good English speaking skills. So therefore, um, I always enjoyed English throughout school. And when I, um, and I tried my hand at kind of writing throughout school, you know, small limericks, poems, not going to compete with your level of limericks. But the point being that I was dabbling around with the written form uh, before I ever conceived, could conceive that, you know, I might make a living from it. So I I had this fondness for writing, even though I had never actually written much. But uh, during um, my years in Mumbai, I actually started writing blog. I started writing a blog and would write about pretty much anything that came to me. Uh, some of my oldest entries were, you know, what we would now identify as listicles. Uh, vague philosophical ramblings on, you know, uh, the meaning of sport and winning and losing and that kind of stuff. 
eventually i started writing about cricket also started writing about cricket more frequently started uh, a separate blog just for my writing on cricket um so the previous blog could have been anything book reviews song reviews you know what this song meant to me that kind of stuff but this blog was more about what i was thinking about the game i discovered twitter around that time probably 2013 13ish um and discovered that you know there are people abroad who are dedicated women's cricket writers and are writing blogs about their women's cricket so as to give it more and more attention and that kind of things and i thought hey that's something i can do i can you know write blogs about domestic cricket which no one ever talks about and no one ever covers everyone knows julan goswami everyone knows mithali raj okay fine good uh, by now you know bcci has taken over, taken over women's cricket and these people are slightly more famous than they were maybe 10 years ago but domestic cricket no one talks about us so i started doing reviews of tournaments or you know previews of the season i started writing that kind of stuff on my blog and putting it up on twitter eventually someone picked it up wisden india reached out saying that uh, we would like you to write for us and at that time i was like so absolutely naive zero idea about how to have conversations about money i wrote my first probably 10 odd articles for them didn't even ask for any money and later you know the good people at wisden india reached out to me hey have you asked have you received your uh, payment for this kind of thing uh, like oh, no 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 i haven't <laughs> so that that was happening in parallel while i was playing cricket uh, my blog for wisden india ran for um you know, ran in that period um, i was actually writing some some kind of anti bcci stuff i mean i don't mean to be anti bcci but i was writing about you know how women's cricket has changed some for the better and some for the worse while i was playing which is kind of yeah which is kind of i didn't even like i said i was just so naive that i never even Uh, appreciated that there may be consequences for this kind of thing also because it was so such a small thing i was like no chance anyone of import is actually reading this so it's okay and then i was finding a sense of satisfaction and uh, purpose through that because again like i said you know everyone can do coaching but very few people were actually very few cricketers i don't think anyone else i may be wrong but i don't think anyone else was actually writing about the game while they were playing the game and in this sense i was kind of being inspired in a way by what was going on in other countries where you know blogging about niche game is a very big and mainstream thing in its own in its own right there will be any epic any like niche game and i don't know why chess is coming to mind i don't want to say <laughs> chess right now <laughs> uh, but lawn bowls i'm sure there are uh, very active blogs about lawn bowls and very active communities about lawn bowls in um for example maybe australia so i was kind of following the leads of these kind of communities and um writing and putting my stuff out on twitter and finding that oh this is interesting so after i quit like having no plan when i quit but after i quit one of the first uh, things that i did was i reached out to some people within the media saying that hey this is what i have done before would you be interested in hosting these kind of articles and they said yes and they said okay we'll pay you x amount of money for uh, each article and you write x amount of articles per month i was like oh i can make some money here it was not a lot, lot of money but it was i had never been able to conceive that you know i might be able to support myself financially or even start off supporting myself financially through writing about cricket i was like this is cool and so i started writing about cricket i started discovering that you know rather than just writing from home you can travel and cover tournaments and there is something called accreditation where you become a an actual member of the media and when you gain that accreditation which is basically a a pass for a media person to cover a particular tournament and then then this very interesting little journey happened before the accreditation or oh no actually at that point i had i had re- received accreditation and covered a, a 2016 uh t20 world cup covered a couple of women's games in that tournament so that was my first ever assignment as a written journalist you know where i'm actually at the ground i'm in a press box oh so this is what a press box is like you know the heroes have kind of changed rather than wanting to run into uh a julan goswami i i i'm running to so osman sami would then oh my god i read his work he's sitting right here that is so cool those kind of moments i'm having um then i have this little bit of a, a journey um the women's big bash has uh, begun um indians are going to be playing in it for the first time harbanpreet kaur and smriti mandana i figure 
I have a few friends in Australia. There are going to be Indians in Australia. There's going to be no one else really covering it from India. Why don't I travel and see if I can uh, cover this tournament on my own, like totally freelance. Reached out to a few people saying, hey, will you guys be interested in articles? It was nowhere near, you know, the cost of covering my trip. It was still going to be significantly out of pocket. But at the same time, because I had, I was able to live with friends, I wasn't really incurring as, as much cost as I might have. And I went to Australia for a couple of months. And I went to Brisbane, I went to Melbourne, I went to Sydney. And I I just experienced that tournament as a journalist. I wasn't writing about it every day. But I would go to every game. I would sit in the designated area, which is called, which is, you know, what they pass for a press box. Because these are small community games. The WBBL is not as big a tournament as it was before. I also happened to be around, um, at the same time, the Australian Open is being, playing, uh, being played. So I visit the Australian Open for the first time. So there is this exposure to a wider sporting experience um, and a different culture, a culture in the country, which is sports mad. Which really, um, which really, I wouldn't say it was like a pivotal moment, but it was a moment of broadening of my horizons because I'd been to Australia before. I'd been to Australia three times as a player, but you're a player, you're staying in a hotel, you're going from a team bus, you're going to a ground, you're coming back from a team bus, you're coming back here far, you know, at most you're going to uh, a little bit of sightseeing at the end of it. Whereas here I was mapping out my own directions, budgeting my own trip. Uh, figuring out what my travel schedule should be, booking my own flights. The entire experience was just so educational. And in terms of opening up, uh, the WBPL is like one of the best run women's leagues in the world. So opening up to the possibilities of, you know, what women's cricket holds, that was that was a brilliant experience. And I have I still have no idea how I, how I actually conceived of it and actually went ahead and did it. You know, if I think about it now, I don't know if I'll do that. But yeah, it was just such a new experience, such a, uh, at every step I'm discovering literally something new. For example, there are separate cycling tracks in Australia for only cyclists. You know, this, the small, small things which blow your mind or um, the fact that the trails here are so well marked or the cricket here is so well done. You know, they have a, they have a Christmas party. Uh, Christmas, of course, in Australia, it's summer. So they have a summer Christmas party on the ground where after the match, they open up the ground for the audience and they have a band in the middle of the stadium and everyone's playing Christmas carols on a cricket ground. These are the kind of experiences which I would never have gotten if I had not gone on that kind of trip. And that was probably the first beginnings of uh, my uh, life as a, as a writer, as a sports journalist, as a member of the uh, written press, so to speak. But... Yeah, uh, almost exploring this sporting landscape in a way I had never done before. As a player, the view is always very bracketed. It's always very narrow. And here I was trying to go as wide as I could. Yeah, that's fascinating. And you and you kind of brought back, you know, memories of my own because I remember in 2006, I really wanted to uh, cover the India tour to Pakistan. And the typical way of uh, doing that was that you you get a freelance gig with an English newspaper because that covers your cost. So I got a gig writing pieces for The Guardian and I did some small audio thing for the BBC while I was there. And my whole thing was, I just want to cover the cost of this uh, tour. So it wasn't even like make a profit. Just cover the cost. You want to go, you want to watch the cricket, you want to soak in the experience. So I kind of totally get that I, i'm curious about craft here because you know one of the uh, and i don't want to embarrass you with praise but uh, you know where you are as a, a writer just looking at uh, sort of your work over the last year you you don't get there overnight you don't get there you know it takes many many years I, like i look back on my own sort of progression as a cricket writer or many of the young writers that i've worked with that you know when you're young you're trying so hard to impress you sometimes you're overdoing the style so on and so forth it takes time for you to find your voice to find the confidence to find that terra where you can just sit back and do what you have to do so you know how did that craft evolve in your case because i i like i have to apologize and say i haven't read your earlier pieces from when you started writing. I've just read what you've done over the last year or so and it's fantastic. And there's one quality that I noted in your work that cuts across not just your writing but also your YouTube work which is that you're not trying to impress. 
you, it's very straightforward. It is what it is. There's no added uh, artifice to that, you know. So is that, again, something that is kind of natural? Is, is there a moment where you say that, do you kind of have to work at that moment if you get what I'm saying? So I'm, I'm very curious, like you did my writing course as well, for example. You're clearly a person who wants to get as much sort of exposure to different aspects of craft and thinking about writing. Take me a little bit through that journey of yours. I think to answer this question, I need to go back to my childhood. Please um, do. Yeah, let's go back. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I need to go back to, um, I mean, my dad used to make regular trips to Mumbai at the time. And uh, we had this uh, custom that, you know, whenever he comes back from Mumbai, the first question, my younger brother and uh, I would ask him, what you got for us? You know, he has to come back and he has to bring us a gift. So, um, which still in our family is called the what you got for us gift. Um, and very often those would be books. Very often he would bring back your Nancy Drews and your Hardy Boys. There was no end of Enid Blyton's uh, littered around my childhood. There was <laughs> this memory of uh, spending so many um, months reading Lord of the Rings and our entire family was reading it. And it would be, you know, this, it would just be situated in our bathroom because I, unfortunately, we have a lot of people who used to read uh, while in the toilet. And it is this kind of, um, maybe, maybe just an extension of that environment where English was emphasized at a young age. Uh, therefore, reading was also emphasized at a young age. And I read exclusively fiction at the time. I found nonfiction boring. And uh, it is interesting. Recently, someone put out a quote on Twitter saying that, you know, uh, fiction, nonfiction greater than fiction. Uh, I was like, yeah, maybe. I mean, nonfiction might be what, uh, what I read now and what I find really, you know, helps me level up in uh, whatever I'm doing. But I spent my entire childhood reading exclusively fiction, reading like fantasy, a uh, little bit of sci-fi here and there. And maybe that's what ingrained a, a sense of storytelling in me. Because I didn't, like I said, I did a BSc after my graduation. I played cricket for 15 years. I have no formal education in writing. My education is just my childhood, my experiences, the fact that I like to read. Um, and once in a while will, you know, take the effort of reading an autobiography. And those are the kind of books that interested me at the time. So... The evolution of the craft definitely starts from the reading habit, which is just a part of my childhood. And again, unconsciously has helped me in being a writer and being someone who is able to uh, make a living from writing today. And beyond that, I, I remember reading a lot. Like I said, that phase when I discovered Twitter and uh, suddenly discovered, oh, there's so much to read. And I suddenly discovered that there are so many writers who write about cricket and think about cricket. And like I said, they have from the media a very different background and a very different view. And me as a player, I'm reading that view. And suddenly I think, oh, this their view is so much, I wouldn't say wider or larger, but just different. It's just so different as a as a someone in the media and someone as a writer and really good pieces of cricket writing at the time. And again, my most of my reading has been restricted to cricket and this is something I'm consciously trying to do nowadays is read more about other sports and whatnot. But at the time, Osman Samyuddin, uh, Andrew Fidel Fernando, Jared Kimber's writing some really funny, irreverent stuff. All those are kind of probably influencing that. Very early on, I remembered this or I discovered this quote, which is um, copy technique, not style. And I actually started doing that. I was like, okay, this person has written this nice piece. What technique is they, are they using here? Not consciously, but unconsciously. I wasn't actually trying to name the technique. I was just trying to say, okay, can I write a piece which is something similar to what this person is writing? And, you know, for the longest part, I had no idea what these official journalistic terms were. I had no idea what an opinion piece was. I had no idea the difference between a feature and a stu and a report and a reported piece. I had no idea what a news peg was. Again, these are words that I discovered when I kind of got into the field and I had to kind of uh, overcome my ignorance and ask, uh, what is a news peg? And, you know, those are the kind of things that, those are the ways I learned. Being a freelancer had its advantages in terms of in terms of being kind of on the outside and therefore not being insulated into any one environment. Uh, at the same time, I, I missed out, I think, uh, on these 
constant exposure to these really good writers which i think sometimes being in in an organization gives you but and it it is funny i mean in the process of building out my sports journalism course i read out i re- went back and read a few of my pieces and some of the pieces were like yeah okay good honest effort some of the pieces were actually good like i i picked up some old pieces as examples of you know writing that i had done which worked well and which kind of still holds up so i wouldn't call it talent but i would call it a culmination of the environment where a english was emphasized b reading was emphasized c education was kind of emphasized and then add into that my unique experiences in sport allowing me to kind of bring a viewpoint that others didn't and therefore kind of giving me a point of difference in you know among so many other bloggers no one was writing about women's domestic cricket no one was writing about well, not no one but very few people were writing about women's cricket so therefore when someone wrote about it even if it wasn't written really well people uh, read it and people shared it and even if it is just a like a reporty piece on just providing information people read people shared it and therefore i got a little bit of a uh, following on um, social media but honestly it's only in the process of building out this sports journalism course that i have really thought about what makes me a good writer what works what doesn't work what are the things i tend to use what are the writing devices i tend to use more what has contributed to how i have progressed as a writer so far also one other non craft thing that is an essential element i think of why i have succeeded as a writer is uh, being brave in terms of what i write because you know i'm constantly almost towing that line being someone who is in the cricketing system but also sometimes having to criticize that same system but when in doubt unlike like i said my evolution as a person over the last few years has reflected in my professional work as well where i have more often than not silenced that inner doubt and been brave um and try to try to tell my truth if not uh, the truth as i see it those are actually two words which i try to remind myself of you know courage and truth is are two things that i want to use in the content that i create you mentioned coaching and and uh, like one of the things i uh, realized after i taught, taught my writing course for a while that it in a subtle way changed the way i looked at my own past writing as well where perhaps unlike you i mean i might like some of my earlier work but a lot of my earlier work were like cringe max like what is this what am i doing i i tell my students not to do this and i'm doing the exact same thing and it just kind of sharpened uh, the way i look at my own writing and um, uh, sort of has that been a process with you through your multiple sort of coaching stint it's like or rather your coaching lanes like one lane of course is sports journalism and writing there's another lane which is cricket where i was going through a bunch of your fabulous videos on uh, batting right and it, it's so intricate and um, so detailed and all of that and uh, do you sometimes wish that you had been coached at the start of your career by someone like you oh yeah absolutely i mean half of the expression and through i may i mean through the content right now is that you know this this information is now available take it do something with it yes i mean uh, having had a career where you know didn't really have this one fixed coach moving from influence to other influence it's not been a, the driving motivation of uh, what i do but it's been a part of that it's been you know the uh, thrill of being able to share this and rather than in a cricket academy it being uh, learned for example the cricket coaching videos Uh, in a cricket academy, fifty people learning it, or maybe twenty people learning it, the fifty thousand people learning it. That was uh, a revelation in terms of you know the power of YouTube, and I was lucky, fairly lucky enough that I could discover that power pretty much accidentally and fairly early on in the whole uh, creative journey. In terms of the writing part, yes, absolutely. Like I said, I've really started thinking about my writing now, and therefore I've tried to. reverse engineer my own process which is instinctive until now i would just put words on the page and then you know try and refine them it's a very crude process but a very instinctive process a process kind of also driven in large part by emotion because very often i'm i'm not someone who's employed to write every day so therefore i write when i feel like it and i have that you know again a lucky situation where i have that 
So I was usually writing from a place of emotion. I'm angry about this. I'm sad about this. I'm happy about this. Wonderful match played. Oh, this could have been better. I wish this was different. Those kind of things usually came across in my writing. And maybe that's one point of connect and one point of, you know, why it has connected with so many people. But in terms of the actual process now, after having built out that course, after having created a process which other people can take and, you know, you can apply it to yourself and see if it works for you. Now I follow that process. Now I sit down and I go through my own processes and see if I've met my own checklists. Uh, because this is literally how I've, you know, it's absolutely like how a cricketer will uh, identify that this is your process, results and processes. We talk about it. When your hand comes this close to your ear, the ball goes on off stump line. When you tick X, Y, Z boxes in writing, the piece is likely to come out better, cleaner, clearer, like you constantly emphasize. And therefore, that is something that I follow now. Whereas before it was very instinctive. And like a year ago, if you had asked me how you do it, I would not have been able to tell you. I would just like, I write when I'm angry. That's what that's what I would have said. <laughs> A good reason to write among other reasons. So, you know, one of the things that I kind of uh, talk about in my course and I also uh, draw a cricket metaphor uh, from it is mindful learning and learning that you're just kind of taking by osmosis. So a lot of cricket learning is mindful where you're, you, if you go in the nets for the first time, you know, you, the way your feet are moving, your elbow, the balance of your body, all of that. You're mindful about it. Later, you internalize it completely and uh, you don't need, need to actually think consciously about it. Now, in your case, the learning process process seems to have been and again a reading habit I keep saying is the best way to become a good writer so a lot of it seems to have come from osmosis just by reading a lot you read a lot of great storytelling and, and then that translates into the way you write and you've picked up a lot of good habits without even realizing it and that's not mindful and, and then some of it is mindful especially when we start teaching you know you start noticing that stuff mindfully or if you're studying a writer you like your reverse engineer what they've done and you know all of that so like I, I keep reminding myself though I, I always say when it comes to reading that for me, there's no difference. I mean, as long as you're reading, I don't care if it's mindful or otherwise, because if, if what you're reading is something that captivates you, you'll pick up things from it by osmosis. But do you feel that it that it helps to be more mindful, that we should all be more mindful in terms of craft of the things that we do, whether it is something in a cricketing uh, technique sense, whether it is something in a writing sense, you know, all of these things. You know, it's funny. Um you will try to be mind or my recent experience has been you will I will try to be mindful about you know reading or consuming any kind of content and you know I, I teach a multimedia sports journalism course so it's you know videos podcasts writing that kind of thing so I, I keep saying that you know whatever content you consume you're going to pick up something from it and if you should try and actively do that even if it's you know watching your favorite Netflix show and a lot of these things just come and express themselves in content so randomly. Having not made notes, at some point, something will strike me. Like recently, I wrote a piece on Ashwin. And uh, I ended it with this line. Uh, when is it okay to drop the alpha? When the pack is stronger without him. Yeah, a wolf reference. Okay. So again, where did this line come from? One of my sports journalism students asked me, how did you come up with this line? Game of Thrones. <laughs> <laughs> and I was I was not mindfully watching Game of Thrones. And you know that line in Game of Thrones where the strength of the pack is the wolf and the strength of the wolf is the pack. That's just what somehow popped up in my mind. And I, okay, let's use a wolf reference. That kind of a thing. I was not mindfully watching Game of Thrones. But it turned up. I don't know how. I don't know why. I can't really explain it. So there have been instances where, you know, stuff in my notes has really helped uh, improve the content that I have put out. And there have been instances where, you know, stuff like just comes so randomly and that sticks with people. So I would probably say it's a good habit to develop that mindful consumption. But I mean, who are we if we can really understand? We are not going to pretend to understand how our brains work. Yeah. And just like at the subconscious level, there is so much weird stuff happening. And when it will be useful and when it will be harmful, God alone knows. 
Yeah, well said. That makes a lot of sense. Let's let's kind of talk about your YouTubing now because I was watching your video about uh, that intimidating video I referred to at the beginning about doing commentary twice a day and all that. And at the beginning, there is this uh, sequence, this montage where you're making filter coffee. And I straight away thought of Peter McKinnon, the YouTuber whose coffee montages are really famous. So tell me a little bit about what got you into try uh, YouTubing. Did you uh, intend to do cricket stuff or did you intend to do vloggy stuff? Who are the YouTubers that you kind of uh, liked? What, what what were the kind of values that you picked up mindfully from people? Like that whole coffee montage, I, I just looked at it and I thought she must have watched Peter McKinnon. So now you can confirm if that's true or not. But yeah, take me a, a bit through your uh, early part of your YouTube journey as well. I have watched Peter McKinnon, but I must say that, you know, again, this is the weird unconscious, subconscious stuff that I'm talking about. I am 100% sure that I did not think about Peter McKinnon probably for a year or so, even while I was making that coffee montage before you uh, brought up his name. Like I watched his videos probably a long time ago. Uh, but again, you know, subconsciously what all we internalize, God alone knows. Uh, if someone can figure out the subconscious one day, it will be a very big achievement. Um, but... YouTube was a very interesting phase. Again, I must emphasize that this was a phase where I was receiving a lot of support from home. Uh, again, not having a regular job. Uh, and I say that with air quotes. Um, having quit my railways job, you know, much to the consternation of my grandfather, who still wants me to do engineering and uh, have a permanent job and a pension. There was a tremendous amount of support from home. I was back in Pune living with my parents. And... There was this space to kind of, you know, figure it out yourself. I went to Australia for a couple of months. There was, um, and therefore, therefore I was in a phase of my life where I had a lot of time. You know, I was writing from time to time and that kind of paid the bills. But uh, it was not my job. I was not doing it every day. So I had some time in my life kind of figuring out what I was, uh, what I would like to do. Briefly flirting with the idea of writing a book. And then I... <laughs> This is one of my favorite stories in life about, you know, what can lead, lead you where. Then I started playing Pokemon Go. Okay. <laughs> um, again, you know, 90s kid having grown up watching those cartoons and Pokemon being one of those cartoons. This game suddenly took over the world and I was like, okay, let's try it out. And having no idea how to play it, I randomly Googled or maybe went onto YouTube and tried to learn how to play it. And this is the first time I had consciously used YouTube to learn something. Until that, you know, YouTube was a place where I, I watched trailers once in a while or YouTube was a place where videos I was intentionally watching happened to be hosted. I didn't go on to YouTube to actually watch something. So this is the first time I'm on YouTube and I'm watching this video by a vlogger in the US. His name is Nick. His channel's name is Trainer Tips and... He's basically making daily vlogs, explaining his processes of playing Pokemon Go. He's a Pokemon Go nerd. And I'm like, oh, these videos are cool. And I start playing Pokemon Go. I keep watching his videos regularly. Um, he has this lovely uh, vloggy style. Um, and I think, hey, maybe I should try that. And that's literally how the YouTube channel started. I like made a few calls um, in happened to get some advice from uh, the person who today is uh, the head of production for uh, my YouTube channel. And he basically told me, use this camera, use that camera. This is fine. That is fine. Just go and do it. And yeah, I was kind of just imitating what I was seeing on uh, YouTube, what I was seeing on what I was seeing other people do. And at the time I had just gotten a dog. He was about a year old. And therefore, I was spending a lot of time outdoors with him. I thought, okay, let's... And I'm an outdoor person. I'm, I like hiking. I like uh, going on any kind of uh, trip which is taking you closer to nature and that kind of stuff. Even like today, it's a big part of my life. But I was like, maybe I can make a show about cricket done outdoors. You know, someone talking about cricket but doing it outdoors. Just randomly trying to combine whatever passions I have. Uh, in the most generic way possible. So I started making vlogs. If you go back to the first three videos on my channel, they are vlogs where I'm exploring some place and talking about cricket side by side. And this is a time where, like I said, I have a lot of time in my life. Well, I have more time than uh, I, I had time. And therefore, I'm on YouTube learning. I'm learning how to use a camera. I'm on YouTube learning how to shoot. I'm on YouTube, most of all, most important of all, learning how to edit my own videos. Again, 
I am a BSc graduate who played cricket for 15 years, worked in a government office, have zero idea about how all, all this technology works. And suddenly YouTube is teaching me all of this. I was like, oh, this is so cool. And that process of learning and implementing what I've learned, it gives you a little bit of a high. It gives you a little bit of a sense of satisfaction. This is that, you know, A, it's so new. Maybe everyone nowadays uh, finds this very normal, you know, having a YouTube channel and doing all this. But 2016, I remember going to the YouTube office and the head of YouTube uh, India or head of YouTube sports, I think head of YouTube India. He's like, oh, I remember in 2016, 17, you were the only channel who was doing this. And it happened to be so. I was, you know, happened to be one of the first people who discovered that this process of learning and this process of creating, using what you've learned on YouTube is fun. And so therefore I was just doing it for fun. And uh, the fourth video I made, I thought, let's, okay, let's mix it up and let's make a video on how to choose a bat. So that was the first how to video I made. And uh, I made that video. It's still in a vlog style because that's what I liked to do. And I still like it more than uh, hardcore tutorials. But uh, I made that video and it kind of exploded. And suddenly my channel has 4,000 subscribers. I'm like, oh, there's something here. So let me think about it. Let me try and do it seriously. Um, and that's that's kind of how YouTube started. Well, and, and you have, I think, more than 300,000 now or something like that? Uh, some 2,80,000 right now. 2,80,000 right now. <laughs> okay. So like one of the things I noted, which I uh, alluded to earlier, but one of the things I noted about your uh, YouTube uh, as it is now from the recent videos that I watched is the lack of self-consciousness. Is is that it's just, you know, you're not overthinking it. You're not trying to be too stylized uh, despite the filter coffee montage. Uh, it, it's almost like what you see is what you get. And, and you know, one of the sort of the things that I say that creators sh should pay more attention to and should cultivate, and that's an important quality. It's just authenticity in terms of being authentic to who you are all the creators i enjoy listening to in podcasts or watching on youtube are just authentic to who they are so, you know whatever the subject might be of their podcast or their particular video or whatever i'm really watching it for them i've kind of gotten a comfort level with them and therefore that's why I'm, I'm i'm there that's why i'm hooked that's why i'm kind of going there so you know again is this something that uh, was there from the start or, or is it something that you kind of evolved to like did you was there a time where you were overthinking it was there a time where um you know you thought more stylistic ticks were important or you you just figured out that this is the easiest way to do it and not to overthink it and uh, so on and so forth i don't think that's completely what it is like for example that video that you mentioned the day in the life you know it starts with me really bleary eyed and exactly what <laughs> you're not trying too hard to make yourself look good which, which is great which is yeah, in, and in that video, I was consciously doing that. Like, literally, I decided first thing in the morning, I'm going to film. But while watching it back, I was like, oh, God, that looks so bad. <laughs> no, no, I disagree. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, you know, later on in the video, looking at it and thinking, oh, there's like a weird curly hair sticking out here. And uh, this should have been better. And that should have been better. And when I'm filming, I do try and present um, there is absolutely, I mean, it's kind of become part of my job presenting, but at the same time, not presenting too much. If you meet me outside of, uh, YouTube, I'm definitely going to talk differently. I don't have, I have a script, for example, on YouTube. Usually I'll have a fair idea of what I want to say. Um, I will do takes. I'm not, uh, you know, this absolute authenticity person, but at the same time, as a person, I'm not a, uh, I'm not a person who worries a lot about how I look. Uh, I'm not a person who, uh, you know, I've never been into makeup. In fact, when that's one of my worst, uh, that's one of the things I like the least about, you know, having to sometimes work in TV or in a studio, the just uncomfortable amount of makeup that uh, they put on us. I've never been someone who has, you know, consciously gone out of the way to dress in a certain way. Usually I'll just be most comfortable in what I'm most comfortable. And I think that comes across. That comes across as, you know, even stylistically of I'm okay with a first thing in the morning shot because that's what it's supposed to be. It's a first thing in the morning shot. But if it's supposed to be a shot where I'm really trying to um, convey a crisp, organized look, which is still me, I will do that. I will put in the effort to make sure that I am so presentable. 
and there is a certain amount of i mean off camera i'm slightly different but only slightly and that's probably the best way to describe it yeah no i get what you're saying that you know like even the intros to my podcast for example like in this conversation i'm just being me but in the intro to my podcast i am kind of presenting but it's also kind of me it's not contrived that that's a similar thing so i get what you mean when you say you're presenting and you've got a script and all that yeah i get that but at the same time it, it doesn't feel contrived i'm not trying to make it not feel contrived yeah uh while at the same time i'm not trying to make it uh, you know unless it's a vlog like that i'm not trying to make it look completely casual either yeah 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 i mean i will pay more attention to the lighting than i will to hairstyle that's me yeah that, that that's kind of remarkable because i think that kind of lack of self consciousness is just great like you know i'm also thinking of starting something on youtube and and that self consciousness about just the physical aspect of it is uh, you know kind of the biggest stumbling block though i know that once i start and i get past it it's kind of fine but you know audio is easy that way you don't really have to w- worry no there i totally agree which is why i mean you know out of the commentary work that i do uh, doing radio commentary is my favorite because there it's not about what you look like it's about what you know and how you say it and uh, that is the probably most natural form of commentary uh, that i've uh, experienced and that is something that i really enjoy doing purely for the reason that you know you don't have to present visually you just need to present almost intellectually and vocally so let's talk about commentary like uh, you know there are very different views of what good commentary is before satellite television kind of took over india if you go back to the richie beno school of thinking the richie beno school of thinking really is that the viewer can see what is happening on the screen you don't need to describe it if you have something to say with that adds to that say it otherwise keep quiet whereas uh, you know the brief on indian satellite television for the early group of commentators in the 90s was simply that don't let there be a quiet moment so you kind of had to talk you had to sort of fill all the space with the uh, description and that uh, there was a danger there that then you just get banal and you know all of those things kind of happen so when when you started uh, doing commentary wh- what was the kind of brief you gave to yourself like how does one define good commentary and obviously is different on tv and radio because radio the person isn't actually seeing the action so you got to get into that as well but what was your notion of commentary going in how did it evolve how did your style as a commentator evolve and what did you find difficult and what did you not find difficult so to say so my first experience with commentary was probably australia where i went and you know uh, word got around that Uh, the someone from india here and since there was subjects of interest in terms of two indian players abc radio wanted to get some perspective get the indian perspective and that was the first time i put on a mic and quite nervous luckily i had the role there of an expert so you know you would usually dis- describe commentators in two roles one is a caller and one is an expert where the caller is having to especially on radio describe what happened and the expert will have to describe why it happened so the first few opportunities that i got were opportunities which were usually you know in the break commentary when i could just talk about my experience with women's cricket and that felt fairly natural and it felt fairly you know okay i know i know my stuff so therefore i can put it across like i said i mean communication in english had always been a strength so this was just about overcoming those initial butterflies of oh my god your life and getting started and once i got started i used to usually get into the flow so that was how radio went uh when i went to tv for the first time this was i got an opportunity to commentate on a challenger trophy a women's challenger trophy uh first time commentating with uh, the bcci first time commentating on something that is going up on tv on a major channel like star sports there the brief to myself was play your role again usually i was only slotted as the expert because inexperienced as a caller in india the culture is kind of different in tv commentary the roles mix a former cricketer can be both expert and caller depending on your position in the roster usually my role has been of the expert being trying to add some layer of insight and that was probably one brief i had to myself that you know if this is happening what is the what is the background story and that's one area i worked really hard the whole journalistic training of you know interviews research really helped in that sense that i remember that that challenger trophy in fact 
I got there a day before. I tried to watch practice. You know, I arranged to stay with a friend. I hadn't, hadn't actually got official accommodation that day. But I arranged to stay with a friend, watched practice. The next night, once I checked into my official accommodation, which is the same hotel the players were staying, I went around room to room and sat the players down and had a chat with them. Like, What's your backstory? Where do you come from? And especially the younger players, because I had been retired a couple of years. There were players who I had not played with and against. I didn't know their stories. I had to make sure I knew their stories because like I am the voice of these people. I am the one who's responsible with telling their stories. So I had to make sure I knew those stories. So I went room to room chatting like Didi up that kind of a uh, like completely unscheduled unannounced. Hi, I'm just going to take 15 minutes of your time and ask you about your life kind of conversations. <laughs> and that helped. I mean, if you are caught on a, on a moment where, you know, the, caller has thrown to you, Snehal, tell us about this person. And you don't know that comes across on on TV or on commentary as bad commentary. It comes across that you're faking it. And if you actually have done the research, then you can tell the stories. And that might have been the brief I gave to myself is that, you know, A, it's your responsibility to tell these stories. B, it's your responsibility to grow the game. And that is kind of one of the things that has driven a lot of my um, later career. I mean, even one of the reasons I got into writing on women's cricket and I did most of my early writing on women's cricket was that no one was writing about women's cricket and I knew I could and I knew I could make an impact. So the same kind of awareness while going into commentary where if you do this well, it will help grow the game in whatever small way. They are the story. They are the ones who are going to do it uh, primarily. I am just the storyteller. That was kind of the brief I gave myself. But I always had an awareness that, you know, unless both those aspects are in sync, the value of what is happening on the field won't go across to the viewer or the listener. One kind of strand, uh, one sense that I got through your writings and your um, uh, videos and stuff was that much of the stuff that you did after actually you know, retiring as a player was driven by your passion for uh, women's cricket in India. Like you talk about how, you know, you loved coaching because, you know, you didn't get that coaching. And, and now all these girls have access to that uh, coaching. Similarly, you know, writing about the women's game, nobody else is doing it. So you're doing it. Not just coaching cricket, also coaching sports journalism. You're also now not just writing about women's cricket, but just writing about cricket, you know, writing about cricket really, really well. So is that passion still sort of the single driving force that gets you into all of this or do you see yourself as a creator outside of someone who's come as a former player herself do you also see yourself as a creator like I noticed that you've also got another uh, sideways YouTube channel which is not about cricket coaching which is just about vlogging and you did a recent vlog about the trek you took and stuff so like was it always the case that you thought that oh I'm a creator and I'll do these uh, cricket things or were you driven into these things because of your passion for cricket and uh, then you kind of began to redefine and expand. So what's been your thought process and your uh, sort of the way that you look at yourself? I definitely think of myself as a creator, but this creator would not exist if that uh, passion for women's cricket was not there. I mean, that was the, that was the material that needed an outlet. And that outlet happened to be, you know, starting with writing. And mostly the women's cricket stuff has been conveyed through my writing. YouTube has mostly been stuff where I'm, I, I enjoy this process of, like I said, learning and then applying. Similarly, learning and then sharing what you've learned is also something that uh, gives you a little bit of a kick or gives me a little bit of a kick. Um, and I enjoy that process independent of, independent of women's cricket or independent of my passion for cricket in general. I mean, my passion for cricket is not completely how to say indestructible like there there will be phases and there was a phase just after the IPL after having done commentary almost every day uh, where I didn't want to watch cricket for one week but there I still might feel like you know oh I, I might be able to make a video or I might be able to do other stuff so the passion for the subject definitely existed first and then the outlet for it has probably defined me as a creator but if you ask me what I will want to and be passionate about creating, it will always be something related to growing the game, growing the women's game. Like even now, my storefront, you could say, doesn't really have a lot of women's cricket. You know, I might be writing on women's cricket, yes, but I might be writing on other cricket also. I might be doing YouTube videos on cricket in general and where 80% of my viewers are boys. 
But in the background, there are projects running where I'm thinking, how can I make an impact on this game? How can I help the Indian team win a World Cup? How can I help the Indian domestic players get a better deal? Um, those kind of things always occupy space in my mind. And they may not always find a creative outlet, but there will be something or the other running. And again, I'm very lucky to be able to, uh, you know, make a living from this kind of thinking, just thinking about the game and trying to find solutions for it, which I really uh, appreciate and remind myself to be grateful for. Uh, but that thinking process and that uh, desire to fix the problems that I see in women's cricket has not really gone away. And that's probably what is then driving and expressing in different ways. So let's talk about women's cricket. And I almost feel hesitant, you know, talking about women's cricket, particularly because I, I, I don't want to slot you as someone who writes about women cricket, because like I said, I just love your writing. You're one of my favorite cricket writers. But women's cricket is simply one of those subjects which not enough people have that kind of depth of knowledge about or uh, sort of talk about, uh, but, you know, the most Indians are kind of saturated with the regular men's cricket that happens out there, but know nothing about women's cricket per se. And uh, you've written this wonderful report uh, called an equal hue along with Karunya Keshav and the late Siddhant Patnaik. And uh, let's kind of talk a little bit about that because I love reading that paper in the sense that it laid out in great detail across all these different categories, not just what is wrong with women's cricket, but what can be done to improve it. And just as a vision document and as a, you know, taking stock of where things are, I just found it eye-opening in many ways. So tell me a little bit about what it involved. Like, you know, why did you write that? What was the impetus behind it? Like, I know you were one of the, I think, three journalists uh, present during the 2017 World Cup final. I think Karunia was also one of them. So w what was the impetus which made you decide that this is something that needs to be done? Did you feel that there was a serious audience for it? Not audience in terms of eyeballs, but in terms of people who would act in the board who would actually do something about it. Tell me a little bit about what led you to the report and uh, so on. So let me pick up on um, the fact that the third journalist uh, in uh, that 2017 World Cup was Siddhant. Um, oh, so the three of you. Yeah. So and that was kind of where it started because uh, the two of them were working for Wisden India at the time. I was freelancing um, and the three of us were the only ones who were traveling uh, to cover the World Cup in, in entirety. Then after India reached the finals, a lot more media coverage swept in, which was great. But I must like really mention here the influence that Siddhant also uh, had in this entire project. Um, that was the first time I actually uh, spent time with him. I'd met him once in the Wisdom India office, but we, we were housemates on that tour. So uh, we had the same schedule. So we basically had planned our accommodation and our travel, etc. together. And we chatted so much about women's cricket. And of course, he was, I mean, not there just because he was working with uh, Vision India. Even before that, in all his time, he had, he and Karunya had, had put up a huge body of work on women's cricket. They were one of the few people who were writing about domestic women's cricket, international women's cricket before 2017. You know? Remember, 2017 is the moment where women's cricket became cool again. And I'm always going to have tremendous respect for the people who were putting in a lot of work behind the scenes before that. And Siddhant was one of those people. And he has a sister who, you know, he saw, you know, a lot of similarities between her and me. This sporty kid, always not afraid to play with the boys, standing out. And there was always this desire to kind of make the world a better place for people like her. And therefore, this kinship with the underdogs, you know, whether it's domestic men's cricketers or uh, women's international cricketers. And so the loss of the... 2017 World Cup final, even for that final, the three of us were sharing a house together in uh, London and we kind of grieved it in that final in our own ways. I I remember finishing my filing at some ridiculous hour at night uh, and after that match, just collapsing in the kitchen and crying. I mean, that was the time where the emotion finally came out that, you know, we, we were so close and we lost by nine runs. And after that, we kept talking, especially Siddhant and me, about what we can do to help the game, what we can do to try and make it better. So, I mean, for a start, we decided, okay, let's compile our suggestions for whatever it's worth. And we made a, a very rough document, which had some excellent suggestions. I mean, even Siddhant had really put in, you know, he had event management background. So use that kind of a background to draw this up. 
um he happened to speak to uh, nandan kamath who you've had on your pod before who uh, has founded something called the sports law and policy center which is a body which is dedicated to kind of publishing these kind of works which create a almost a body of work on that particular sport so nandan really encouraged us to widen and deepen the scope of the report and make it you know a g- basic groundwork document where anyone who wants to have any kind of influence in women's cricket can read this get an idea of where they are where the action areas are required um and so we and so we set about that um during the course of making that report siddhan's uh, sickness got worse and uh, eventually he didn't survive after that i asked karunya to come on board uh, and the two of us kind of finished that work and during the course of the lockdown actually when we both got a lot more time so a project that was kind of in the making for 3 years put it together uh, we based it not just on our own experience but a survey conducted of uh, 350 state cricketers so who were really generous with our time which again like the sense of community within the women's cricket circuit uh, where they all volunteered to fill up this survey because again there was a lot of goodwill built up by karunya and siddhant also in the process of writing their book so when they knew that they were involved in this they were you know a lot of cricketers participated very actively and this kind of then led us to the equal hue report which was published in 2020 it is the groundwork for doc- for action that needs to be taken next it's a document that analyzes where the gap areas are it's the document that really says that you know okay if anyone whether it's the bcci whether it's a broadcaster whether it's some ngo who wants to do good work or whether it's a corporate who has csr funds they would like to use it to help women's cricket grow these are the areas where you can start this is the way where you can make an impact through the recommendations that we've made along the way you know we've also had this sense of okay now we've done this analysis now what and therefore it's moved into action and uh, we've formed uh, karunya myself people at the sports law policy center have formed the equal hue project where we are, we are trying to fill some of these gaps ourselves and one of a couple of the gaps that we identified were uh not enough information about women's cricket you know if a women's cricketer is sitting in katak bhuvneshwar orissa or um dharamshala do they know the pathways in their state so karunya really headed a project which compiled information for each state of you know what the existing pathways in that state are how a, a woman who's interested in cricket a girl who's interested in cricket can find cricket near her what the state association uh, processes are what their phone numbers are wherever available whatever information is available has been put together in a website on the equal hue website where you know we're aiming to fill up that information gap they also worked really hard on publishing a an audio book where uh, there's a women's cricketer as a central figure in it for 5 to 8 year olds or 5 to 10 year olds so the next generation should grow up with women's cricketers in their consciousness so that's some of the projects that the equal hue project is working on like i said there are projects in the background that we are working on we have uh, plans and we are reaching out to various brands to partner with them on these plans to just support the ecosystem more and more be it through scholarships be it through tournaments and that's i think the the big opportunity and something that i hope uh, really allows us to make an actual impact on the ground because there's only so much you can do is what i've discovered writing about a sport but you know can we actually make an impact on the ground through our projects that's the that's the new focus almost you know the hope has been voiced by many that the 2017 uh, world cup final with all the viewership that it got and so on uh, the world cup in fact not just the final with all the viewership that it got could be something like the 1983 moment for uh, men's cricket was but my question is you know i think in the life of any sport or any activity there is this transition from where early on all the people who care about it deeply and are making initiatives are people who are just passionate about it and are motivated by that passion and that's what driving them and then the next phase that comes is when it crosses a certain tipping point and people are instead motivated by commerce 
you know so people begin to do things for women's cricket because they feel there is a market for it and then things really improve then infrastructure improves then all of these things you know like you've got a section where you speak about barriers to participation which include cultural barriers physical barriers financial barriers then those start to uh, disappear you've got a section where you talk about domestic cricket and the grassroots and how the ecosystem there can be much better and those kind of uh, start to vanish so how close is that point have we reached that point have we crossed that point is it still some way in the future give me a sense of how the game is uh, sort of evolving in uh, that sense because it is true that women's cricket is much more in the consciousness of a lot of viewers but are they actually uh, is there enough women's cricket happening are they watching it actively what's the ecosystem like beneath the elite game give me a little bit of a sense of that so uh, let me answer the uh, driven by commerce kind of uh, angle first um, the last ipl t20 women's challenge that happened uh, where it involved three teams uh, was held in dubai alongside the men's ipl of 2020 um, was the first tournament to attract sponsors was the first tournament where jio came on board as independent title sponsor i mean this is very uh, prudent and smart of the bcci to not just piggyback it along with the men's tournament and the men's sponsors and identify it as a separate property and see what value there is for this property and jio uh, came on board as title sponsor and then all the ipl supporting sponsors came on board for this women's t20 challenge as well wonderful opportunity for you to get branding a uh, wonderful opportunity for you to get exposure and uh, what the bcci treasurer i believe said after that tournament is this is now financially sustainable which i i take to understand that it paid for itself we broken even so if that is the bare minimum of where we are it's a wonderful starting point to be because you can just everything north of this is profit so i think commerce wise that is where the indian team is value wise when right now um it's hard to define a separate value for the indian women's cricket team because how do you define value of a sports property broadcast rights uh what kind of money is being paid by broadcasters to showcase this property which reflects how many advertisers are uh, willing to put money behind this kind of a product it's hard to gauge right now because the women's domestic women's international matches are bundled in to the men's broadcast rights Uh, along with you know the under 19 world cup or those under 19 teams same with the shirt sponsorship the shirt sponsorship is sold as a bundle for the men's women's and under 19 whereas i think now in the next cycle which is 2023 onwards there is a case there is a strong case to separate this as a separate property let's say women's cricket is sold at a separate property it will earn you I mean by separating women's cricket the overall cost of the men's rights is not going to come down. Yeah. But the but the women's rights might earn you uh you know some amount of money it's not going to be in the range of what the men uh, men's rights are going to earn you but it will earn you some amount of money. That will put a number on the value of women's cricket and that is something I look forward to happening. There's also the fact that if you look at a women's cricket broadcast now for example on these OTT apps you can you can gauge that by how many of these how many ads are off the ott platform itself for example if it's a on hotstar in the breaks how many hotstar ads are you seeing because that is time where they haven't been able to sell it to an advertiser so they put a hotstar ad there so if you see a lot of hotstar ads it means that this property is not really valuable what i've seen is of the recent tour to australia there were a lot of ads Uh, for the women's tour to australia there were ads by brands very few ads by the broadcaster who was sony there was also title sponsors for this series there was also investment by the broadcaster in building up this is for an away series okay hindi tamil telugu three separate languages for broadcast for the women's series beyond just the world feed english commentary that they carry which tells me that's where you that's where they stand in terms of commerce in terms of the underlying structure so much that could be better i mean we talk about the strength of domestic cricket for the men and the finishing school that is the ipl and the india a programs a long time ago for the men's in men's cricket we used to compare australia as a better domestic system why because they have only eight teams whereas we have some 30 40, 30 35 teams and we are diluting our talent therefore the competition is less 
uh, fierce. Therefore, the players are not battle hardened when they come to international cricket. What has changed? I mean, we still have 30, 35 teams, but now we have an India A program. Now we have an IPL. Those are the steps up. So, I mean, for me, it's just common sense to say that you know, apply the same model here. We have 30, 35 teams playing domestic cricket. Please have an India A program. Please have an under 19 program. Please have a women's IPL, and just see how you know. Other countries are scared of India getting it right because of just the sheer number of uh, players that we have. Even despite you know not really trying, a few moves which have bewildered me in the last few years have been the uh, removal of the interzonal tournament. So from these thirty thirty five teams, you are picking talent directly, putting it in the Challenger Trophy, and sending it to international level. Of course, they are going to find that jump slightly difficult. The interzonal level was what gave them a a little bit of a stepping stone. I would love to see that tournament come back. Besides the fact that it just gives more match days to the players. Again, they play too few matches. Uh, spend nine months of the year training and play about four or five matches ODI, four or five matches T20. If you don't qualify for the next stage, that's it. Domestic season over in senior cricket. And what was your other question about the underlying structure or? I'll 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 come back to that just to follow on um, uh, sort of uh, you know what you said of ob- obviously makes sense that if you unbundle the rights you get a proper picture of where women's cricket really stands and therefore the risk of underestimating it is no longer there you you know is it then a problem that BCCI is running both aspects of the game because obviously I'm uh, you know both men's cricket and women's cricket because I get it that in 2006 with all the resources they improved a lot of things they can't uh, take a lot of the abundant money from the men's game and you know use it to give the women's game a leg up but if i just think of incentives within the bcci their huge cash cow is the men's game all their thinking all their organizational work it's natural for it to kind of go there so was it perhaps better earlier in this in just in terms of incentives that if you have a body where you know your job is women's cricket it's nothing else that's all you do that's your incentives that's how you will be judged it's a separate product it's a separate property you know so it, it, do you see there as a structural flaw does the bcci really take women's cricket that seriously what's what's your sense this is an interesting line of uh, thinking and it's something that um, the cricket historian in the uk raf nicholson is uh, researched quite a bit she's actually i think doing an uh, something close to a thesis on how women's sport has fared after it kind of got absorbed by the ruling existing men's body and like i've said there are a lot of things that you know change for the better and there are some things that change for the worse in terms of incentives if you really go that cold i am trying to put my passion for women's cricket aside think about it in terms of a commercial property uh, think about it in terms of you know can this earn me revenue is it worth putting in x amount of money and will i get um, greater than x back in initially no initially it's going to be something that requires a lot of investment of time and money to grow but the potential of women's cricket as a property i think is something that people are missing and you have to kind of think about it in terms of doubling your base rather than you know draining your uh, resources so if one thinks about it like that we've seen how women's sport has just grown into its own cash generating revenue generating property in other sports we've seen the success of the women's big bash league we've seen the popularity of the us uh, national women's football team we've seen pv sindhu as you know a female sport icon although team sport i'll probably uh, should probably take more examples from team sport but there is enough to suggest like we saw with the ipl where the sponsors came on for just which essentially exhibition matches there is enough to suggest that there is value in putting in this investment for 4 or 5 years there are incentives to put in that investment for 4 or 5 years think about it from an ipl team okay suppose an ipl team wants to or you know what are the incentives for an ipl team to start a women's cricket team one is that your yeah, ipl is only a 2 month a year property if you can double that for a small investment okay getting involved with the women's ipl will require a smaller investment than it was for a men's investment you're doubling your branding suddenly because if you have a women's ipl even if it's a one month tournament separate from the men's ipl window suddenly from two months of visibility you got three months of visibility i think those are the incentives that exist 
if you uh, choose to see them if you choose to look at them that way yeah no i completely agree with you that w- women's cricket in the long run is an enticing commercial prospect as well the the worry just is that if f- from the bcci's point of view the whole focus will be men's cricket ipl there's just so much money there that they may not bother about this per se whereas uh, you, you know that's kind of the worry so a couple of final questions uh, i i know i've kept you talking for a long time uh, a couple of uh, sort of final questions one of the subjects on which you've written and spoken passionately is the need for a women's IPL elaborate on this a bit because for me when the men's IPL happened and I, and I remember there were critics of it before it started and I wrote a long piece in cricket info kind of talking about the wonders it would do and even I underestimated them but the, the wonders were not just in a commercial sense i just felt that culturally it would have a big impact in terms of giving many more players a livelihood uh, making the field much more competitive where you don't have the monopsony of the bcci as the only buyer for your services within this artificial environment you have eight people competing to get uh, talented cricketers to build talented cricketers uh, you know instead of 10 people making a living from the game you have 100 people making a that kind of living from the game so it, it just culturally it kind of changed everything so to tell me about what you know your case for a women's ipl do you see a similar sort of thing happening if it's just allowed to exist because like i said it would take a fraction of the investment of the male ipl and i'm i'm pretty sure people would tune in so so just to uh, finish off one uh, point on the previous question is that you know if the bcci can almost have uh, focus completely on men's cricket it's not outlandish to for them you know build up a dedicated women's cricket section and give them a budget and say okay we're not going to pay attention to you at all do whatever you want which would almost kind of be an ideal case scenario for uh, many fans of women's cricket where you know you have a decision maker with some actual power using a budget given by the bcci which is kind of the best of both worlds but to come to the ipl question many ways in which i think about a successful sports team is their value in terms of the broadcast market what makes a successful sports team valuable what made the indian women's cricket team suddenly you know a subject of interest and therefore a subject of commerce um is that performance in a world cup again they kind of backed it up with a performance where they reached the final of the 2020 world cup and uh, let it must be acknowledged that even australia established that record of you know 86174 people in the mcg for a women's cricket final a big part of that um, well a part of that for sure is the fact that india were their opposition if new zealand were their opposition would they have pulled in so many people i'm not sure so which tells you that this indian team if it does well at a world cup becomes a big property becomes a big financial property for you now what will help the indian team win a world cup we've seen the effect with the men's ipl on how it's impacted the performance the international performances of the indian team that is one of the cases that is one of the strongest cases for for creating a women's ipl because it will help you win a world cup so you're creating these other maybe you know you're creating these other eight players in the system but it's going to help the big player get even stronger one of the biggest cases where the incentives are just aligned to really uh, make this absolutely happen make it grow as fast as possible and make it the number one women's league in the world the other impacts of the ipl like we've seen are really the human stories that come out of the men's ipl where you have someone like avarun chakravarty almost given up cricket working as an architect now ipl star indian team player uh, within the indian team itself you have so many of those stories you have shikha pande air force officer and indian cricketer you have someone like a radha yadav whose father was a vegetable uh, seller on literally like a footpath on in mumbai and now you know through money through the money that she's earned for the indian team they able to afford a flat in mumbai those kind of stories and the potential for those stories to effect actual social change because you are talking about a you are talking about women in india you are talking about a group which has its own challenges own social what restrictions or own social obstacles and we've seen that i mean this is a concept that my brothers and i talk about it's 
very often in a lifetime hard to jump up one's socio economic class the class that you are almost born into cricket is a vehicle that allows that cricket is a vehicle that allows you because of the popularity in the country and because of the money associated with the ipl it allows that and i want to hear more stories like that i mean that's my case for a, a women's ipl i want to hear more stories where shafali verma was able to pay for her father to fly out of the country for the first time he is seeing suddenly the world in a whole new light that entire generation is just exposed to something completely different because of uh, what she's done that's the social change that i want to be effected through a women's ipl final question you know one way of kind of transforming women's cricket is through top down action of the kind we've been mentioning that the bcci get its act together and even if they have a separate department i think uh, it's it's kind of a little bit of luck that who will they have in charge there will it be a politician or will it be someone from within the game who really cares about it which is kind of an uncontrollable but i i, I totally get it but one of the ways of driving that change is from the top down the bcci does things they put india a all of that into place all of that happens but the other is also from the bottom up where there is a passion for the game that is coming from the grassroots more people are playing it and and supply eventually meets uh, that demand now clearly that wasn't the case say even when you took up uh, cricket in the sense that you point out about how uh, so much of it is kind of happenstance that you know shubhangi kulkarni dana adulji all the pieces kind of falling into place that took you where they were but cultural barriers physical barriers like you talk in your in, in that report about how you didn't have changing rooms so after a you know grueling uh, session all the boys would just change their t-shirt and go home and you'd be all sweaty and you know you'd put on a jumper over um, what you were wearing because you didn't want people in the local train to have to uh, tolerate your sweat but now with the with the kind of the the changing profile with the fact that people don't need to physically meet a shubhangi kulkarni when they can watch a snehal pradhan video on youtube and get inspired by that or they can even watch like there's a charming talk show that uh, smriti mandhana and i think jibama rodrigues to you know and they can watch that and make them role models uh, so do you feel that in terms of bottoms up something happening there uh, that, that at least there things are changing that happens stance of that sort will no longer be so rare will no longer be so necessary uh, and and just people's approaches you know whereas earlier parents who loved cricket and wanted to live vicariously through their kids might have sent their son to a coaching camp today they'll send their daughter to a coaching camp so what's your sense of the change actually happening in our society in in that context that's a really good question it's probably one that i haven't really uh, thought about before but just thinking about it right now um, i'm i mean, i think about it about how it exists in men's cricket because that is what um, the situation is in men's cricket where the demand is just so much that supply arises that you know there are tennis ball tournaments organized at every little open space you can find because there are people playing tennis ball cricket there who say a chalo tournament banate hai so can we get to that point yes i mean in theory yes it will take a long time for bottom up change to happen it will probably take an event like how it did for india if you think about you know how men's cricket's current situation has developed it's been slow cooked for 30 years it's been slow cooked since 1983 throughout the entire generation of sachin tendulkar worship now into the generation of you know a team that can go abroad and win that's the kind of time i'm talking about that it will take you never know you know there might be a, an incredible event we we you know we underestimate these kind of things there might be an incredible event in women's cricket which just drives that almost overnight you know relatively speaking overnight um and then you might have like you said uh, supply suddenly turning up because there is so much demand i feel there is definitely a shift in terms of how the likes of smriti mandhana are such popular figures nowadays and the influence that they are having on the next generation is probably something we'll only understand once the generation grows up um so it's definitely possible there are so many more ways for people to get into coaching etc and start on their first few steps of the journey but the next few steps are still held by these uh, institutions and therefore you might have more the base of the pyramid does get wider but then to move up the pyramid you do have to move through a few fixed ladders and that's where i i'm a little worried a little cynical about this because we've already seen this uh, since the 2017 world cup 
cricket academies everywhere i mean just after the 2017 world cup so many girls turned up at cricket academies but they don't yet have that many tournaments to really fill their appetite and that's um, i mean thinking back to your uh, conversation with nandan and joy uh, i think nandan was also talking about just creating these tournaments and how that uh, really changes the ecosystem just by virtue of having more opportunities to play i think that is where the demand already exists and the supply needs to step up yeah i guess it's a bit of a chicken and egg thing where the demand exists but it can't express itself in any particular way because there's no supply if you had tournaments you would know how many people are really interested so i guess at some point it you know it's it's up to creative entrepreneurs and passionate crusaders like yourself to kind of change that so you know thanks a lot for giving me uh, uh, so much time on the show i I'm, i'm really looking forward not just to what happens in women's cricket but also your journey as a creator which is i, I think just so inspiring in terms of uh, the kind of output you put out and uh, i'm going to go and watch that video again uh, to kind of hit myself with it and say look how much she does in a day you fool what are you doing <laughs> so thanks so much neil ah uh, it's been my pleasure amit If you enjoyed listening to this episode hop on over to the show notes I have linked Snail's newsletter and YouTube channels there plus there are many other links to enter rabbit holes through you can follow snehal on twitter at snehal pradhan you can follow me at amit verma a m i t v a r m a you can browse past episodes of the scene and the unseen at sceneunseen.in thank you for listening Did you enjoy this episode of The Scene and the Unseen? If so, would you like to support the production of the show? You can go over to sceneunseen.in/support and contribute any amount you like to keep this podcast alive and kicking. Thank you.